Hey, it's Jeff from Home Renovision here. Today we got a video for you, all of my advanced tips and tricks for doing drywall work as a DIYer. We got everything in here included with how to order it, how to hang it, how to finish it, all the tools you're gonna need, and all of my finishing tips that are gonna make you look like a pro. So stick around, don't forget to ask your questions in the comment section, and give us a like if any of this information is good to help you. And today we are in my kitchen renovation project. We're here to talk about drywall and all things pertaining to a real successful installation. Before we go any further, I'm going to encourage you to subscribe to our channel if you haven't, because you're not going to want to miss all of the videos we're doing about this kitchen renovation. It's going to be spectacular, but let's dive right into it. We've already ordered our drywall, and it's sitting here behind me, but what we're going to talk about today is preparation, inspection, how to measure, how to order, how to make sure that everything is ready to go before you start drywalling, because the biggest drag, we're going to call it, when you're installing drywall is having to stop to fix something or you miss a step or something gets buried in the ceiling. So I'm gonna teach you my system for installing drywall quick and effectively, and it starts with preparation. So before we go any further, I'm just gonna let you know that I gave my son Matthew the bulk of the work here, and he's done a pretty fantastic job, but because he's brand new, he's made a few little errors. I'm gonna expect that you guys would have the same kind of situations. So instead of just fixing them first, I'm gonna have him come over and join me. Matt, come on in. We're going to go a quick little tour. We're going to talk about the kind of things that you're going to miss on your projects that Matt also makes. And then we'll show you some quick remedies and solutions to all these little things that'll give you a professional result. So let's get going. First of all, nice. I'm pleased. Now, this project here is a little complicated because we've got, I don't know, 300 lights in the ceiling, right? We've got an 1880s. Uh, it's balloon frame construction. So we don't even have top plates everywhere. We don't have continuous vapor barrier. There's a lot of issues here. So our, our goal in this renovation is to get the house improved as far as the science of the construction, but not to go too crazy, right? Because we've got to find that sweet spot of making sense. Now, um, first of all, our, let's talk about the strapping on the ceiling. So generally we strap the ceilings before we drywall. I don't like to screw right to the floor joists, especially with dimensional lumber, even if it's old, because it has a tendency of wanting to move around and all the vibrations in the house will be transferred into every screw that you install. If you put in strapping first, like we've got, then all the vibrations are transferred through much less fasteners, okay? And the drywall will sit a lot tighter and you'll find you won't get as many nail pops in time. So basically, we're not getting too crazy here. Strapping also allows us to install our drywall from one side of the wall right to the other. So we don't get any butt joints on the ceiling. So that's why we do this. If we were to hang drywall here without the strapping, we'd be hanging it this way. And since the room is over 20 feet long, we'd have butt joints everywhere. And that increases the amount of work. By putting the strapping on, now we're installing our drywall this way. Drywall comes up to 12 feet wide. Our room is just a little over 11 feet, so no butt joints. And we'll show you what a butt joint is later in the next series, if you're not familiar with that. But what we mean is, a butt joint takes three applications of mud and the regular side of the drywall only takes two. So this makes things a lot quicker if you can avoid having butt joints. Strapping's great every 16 to 20 inches and we, we space that out based on where the pot lights are going to be located. So when we go to drill our pot lights, we're not drilling through the wood. This was done well, right? We're all good to go. There is one issue with this. So we did a rough in inspection with the electrical inspector and we had all pots lined up. But since that, we've decided we're going to go three pendants over the island. So what I need you to do, Matt, is I need you to cut this wire and feed it through into that box, just about two or three inches, and then tighten that screw for me real quick. That way I can wire that up later, okay? So you can just curl it around and bring it in the box, okay? There you go. Yeah, those are the access. You just have to bend it open and then wiggle it off. There you go. Now, generally speaking, those boxes are already open, in the open position, so you can just feed the wire in. Beautiful. And if you just throw two inches in there or so, and then we'll tighten that up with the drill. All right, so that's awesome. We've got the wires in. Can you just back them out a little bit so that when we put the drywall on, it's not causing them to be compressed in there? Okay, and then here's the drill. Just tighten up that set screw. Good, and then grab the wire and just bring all those extra oh, wires onto that side of the box. There you go, up into the ceiling. There you go, nice and tight like that. Beautiful. So now you're not gonna have any problem with the compression. Now you got your pliers up on the strapping. That's how I lose most of my tools. Hmm. Try not to do that. All right, come on down. That's good. We're set to go there. Okay. 
So there's just two things that I noticed over here. Um, first of all, this is awesome because you did the bottom part and there's a, a joint, it's taped. This joint here, now because of the age of the home and the fact that nowhere else in this house has got a continuous vapor barrier that's sealed up, if you're just doing one room, I get it, this will work fine. But because we're eventually working our way through the whole house, we're going to bring it up to the standard of air seal. So what I want you to do, since it's full of staples and, and all that kind of jazz, I want you to just take the tuck tape and tape that joint together, top yep. to bottom. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom, where we've got the vapor barrier coming down onto the floor, I want you to get the uh, acoustic seal. And I want you to run a nice thick bead and press that all in and throw in a couple of set staples, okay? Gotcha. Beautiful. Oh, again, using that as a shelf. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> You're going to lose that knife, Wasted man. Wasted on me. I, I got to get you used to wearing a pouch. <laughs> yeah, I guess. There you go. Sweet. Now, there's two ways to seal up a vapor barrier when there's an overlap. One is with the tape. The other one is acoustic seal. Acoustic seal works great in situations where you haven't stapled it all on yet. But since this is stapled, it's just faster for us to get it done this way. Just a quick note, when you're working with this tape, always fold over the edge so that it doesn't seal against itself. It'll just save you a lot of aggravation. Okay, so this is the acoustic seal. Basically, you just kind of like cut the tip off so that it comes out in a nice thick bead. Sweet. And, uh, yeah, so then when I put it on the floor, it'll squeeze in nice and tight. Does that need to be punctured? Probably. Show Probably. the puncture trick. So uh, I guess the, some of these caulking guns have a little like needle here, it pops out. It's always easier, you get full of goop. Yeah, there you true. Go. Just kind of like stick it in there and poke it a few times. It's gonna get messy. There's gotta be a better way to do that. Okay. Right up against the edge of that, okay? Not too far into the room, further back. There you go. And that's, that's, uh, yeah. This stuff works great, but man, it makes a mess, eh? There you go. So press it in. Now we got an air seal. That is awesome. So the secret when you're inspecting your job is go one system at a time. First inspect all of your electrical, then check all of your framing, then check your air barrier, and so on and so on and so on. And if you do that, and you won't be always picking up and putting down tools. You can just keep on working through the room one tool at a time. So while Matt's cleaning out that goop, I'm gonna just throw a few screws. I'm using flooring screws here into my strapping. I noticed that the last row here wasn't done with the nail gun. And wanna make sure that everything is secured properly before you hang your drywall on it. Okay, one other thing you wanna inspect very carefully is your insulation. This is your last opportunity to see it. So you want to visually inspect and make sure that there are no ugly gaps like right here. Okay, if you have an ugly gap, cut open the plastic, get your hand in here and get that filled properly. Most times what it is, is during the installation process, someone will tuck it and a corner will pop out, right? The, every action has an opposite equal reaction syndrome. When you're done that, make sure you get your tape out and seal that vapor barrier up again. Press it in there really good because this tape only sticks under pressure. If you just touch it, it'll, it won't be attaching itself. It'll just fall off. Make sure you do that. That's good. Yep, steps, good. Now we have a problem over here we better address too. So what I have here is a, is a framing issue. I actually are missing the last piece of this interior wall. We should have a stud running along here somewhere to line up here so we have an intersection for my drywall. Now, I asked my son to put in some blocking and he did that. I should have taken the time to explain it properly because he's got it the short side here and what I should have is the wide side, okay? So Matt, what we're gonna get you to do is pull the blocking, set it where the insulation joints are, okay? And then we're gonna go on, on the wide side where the insulation joint is. You pull the plastic and you can throw your screws right here on an angle and you can actually screw right through into that board, okay? It's really easy to install. You can set these screws before you put the board there. And then once you get that done, then you can take this insulation and you can just, you know, lay it in behind the board because there's just enough room because of the old framing, right? It's an actual two by four here. So this R12 won't be compromised if you put it in behind this. And that'll give it a much better seal because by going underneath, you're compressing behind it, but you're creating these gaps. You see that? Right, where the cold air will come through. 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just throw out our laser level here. And this one is a little bit different than the one I usually use. There's my line right there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just throw my line on here. I'll draw right over that laser line. That'll mean that's where the front edge of that two by four is that we're gonna stick on. And that's awesome sauce. And then we'll throw a level on it when we install it after that. So here we go. What we wanna do is we wanna cut our vapor barrier where the installation joint is. Because now, when you go to change that wood, you'll know exactly where it goes, right in the middle. And then we're gonna make like a, cut it like an H. So you got lots of room to get in there and work. Okay, so now you can access your screws, flip that over, boom, boom, boom. And when you're done, we'll just tape it all up, okay? Awesome. There you go, there you go. <laughs> oh, the, the decking screw. Right? We're just lining up our, our stud on that laser line that I made with my, my marker on the plastic. Always great to have uh, markers with you when you're working on your vapor barrier. So much more effective than pencil. Okay, now let's put the level on it. I'll do the level and I'll tell you when. You can hit the top for me first. Right there. There we go, all right. Throw a couple more in for good measure, just to make sure that it's not gonna twist on us. Okay, so our inspection is complete. We've got our back framing, our vapor barriers taken care of, our lighting, our strapping, everything is all done. We're ready for drywall and we aren't gonna to have to take our hands off the installation tools once we get started. That is a huge goal. You'd be surprised how fast installation will go if you don't constantly have to stop to fix little things. The other side of it is, a lot of people when they're drywalling, if they don't have everything prepped perfectly first, the drywallers will just skip right on past all those little mistakes and they'll remain there forever. So if you're doing your own renovation and you're contracting out the drywall, that inspection is golden. Don't expect a drywaller to come in here and do any of that work for you. It'll never happen. Now, what we want to talk about is uh, ordering your own drywall, okay? Remember we talked about strapping the ceiling so we can order our drywall and what we want to do now is just measure the width of the room. It's a little over 11 feet. Okay, which is good. Now drywall comes in traditionally eight, nine, 10, and 12 foot sections, depending where you go. Oh, we just go like that, that's easier, okay? So what I do when I'm doing my order is I'll start, I'll make a list like this, 12, 10, nines, and eights. In a lot of cases I don't buy nines, but every once in a while it's really handy, especially if you have a nine foot ceiling, all of those short walls, it's just perfect, right? So we have uh, 11 feet across, and we have 20 feet the other direction. So the way it's gonna look is, let me just draw this out. Here's my room, okay? So I'm gonna have a sheet that's four feet wide, another sheet that's four feet wide, and so on and so on, okay? There's five of them. That's five times four feet wide, 20 feet long, and it's 11 and change, so we'll buy a 12 foot and we'll cut one end of each of those. That's how we do this. So I need five. One, two, three, four, five. Now, this long wall is going to be installed with drywall on the horizontal, not the vertical. Never install drywall vertically if you are dealing with old frames because they're not parallel, they're not level, they're, they're not straight. You wanna go horizontal whenever you're dealing with, with, with structural lumber. If you're in a house that has steel framing, you can go vertical because they always install it perfectly level and you can always adjust the screw if you need to. Wood does not give you that flexibility. So we have 20 feet, then we have two choices. We can put a 10 and then a 10 on the top part, but then what do you do? Let me just draw this out. So here's my whole long 20 foot wall. If I put a 10 foot and then another 10 foot, I have a joint right here. Then the next sheet, I wanna stagger the joint. It's one of the rules of drywall. You don't want the butt joint in the same place. So I'd want a joint there. And then what am I gonna do with this? Have two joints on a wall when it's not needed? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go 12 feet with an 8, okay? And then I'll go 8 feet here with a 12. That offsets my joints. That makes life nice and simple. I only have one joint in each wall. Perfect. Keep that in mind. So I need two more 12s and I need two 8s. <laughs> and you continue on through the room like that. Measure all your ceilings first. Get all your numbers. 
That ceiling there is 12 feet long and it's 10 feet wide, so I know I need three tens for the ceiling. That means the wall is also 10 feet wide. I got two ends of that, so I need two for each side. Okay, that makes life simple. Now I've got all my major walls already ready done, they're ordered. The only thing left is all the short walls. Now, if your wall is less than four feet, which would be here, anything four feet and less, you can order one sheet to go vertical. Because now you can span from the corner to a corner with one sheet, so you're fine. Anything under that. So I just walk through my room and I pick out all the small ones. I go, that's an eight, that's an eight, that's an eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, boom. And I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I've got all my drywall ordered. Now the last thing I do before I order my drywall, I always toss an extra couple of eights on there because things happen, right? Damage happens, you miss adding something. Uh, it's just nice to have it around. Better to have an extra couple of sheets on the site when you're drywalling than be almost finished and have to go back to the store and pick a couple up, especially if you're getting it delivered because you don't have a truck. All right, so now we got the drywall. Let's talk about how to carry it, where you're going to put it on the job site, and how to load up the room so that you can install it without having to move it over and over and over again to get it out of your way. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm working in my kitchen, but let's just talk about a few other things that are really important because this information is useful no matter where you're working in your house. There are a variety of different drywalls in the market. Now, traditionally, we use what we call half inch, standard, regular, ultralight. All these different terms are the same thing. There's a half inch basic drywall. That's for residential construction. Whenever there's no consideration or no requirement by building code for fire safety or water or moisture control. So most of the house is gonna get that half inch. If you're working in a bathroom, you might have a code requirement for using a green water and mold resistant board. Those are options as well. And generally speaking, it's only specific to a bathroom. Some people use it on the back wall of a kitchen if they're tiling and expecting that there's a sink there for water damage. That's an option as well. The other kind of drywall that is most common is the 5 8 drywall. It's what we call type X. Now, on the back of this drywall, you can see it's just got a print, the date and manufacturer, and that's it. On type X drywall, the drywall itself has got a band written on it and it actually says type X drywall on it. That's for the inspectors when they're doing a tour of the job site. They know, yes, that's fire rated drywall. And it'll even say whether it's 5 8 or half inch because they're different ratings for fire code. We don't want to get into too much of that right now. But in most residential situations, if you're using type X fire wall board, it's because you're in a row house or you have a semi-detached and your neighbor the building code requires a fire separation wall between the two dwelling units, okay? So if you have a, a bathroom that you're renovating and that bathroom wall is on your neighbor's side of the property and you're sharing that wall, that drywall has to be type X. So you want to put in your fire rating wall first, then put in your moisture board, okay? Very important. You can't cheat there because it's a matter of liability in case something goes horribly wrong. Now, the only other time you're going to use 5 8 drywall is if you're using sound control measures. If you're putting insulation and you want to help make things a little bit more dense, you can add one or two layers for soundproofing. And if you want to learn about soundproofing, we're going to put a link in the description because we've got a few videos that are awesome information about soundproofing. And it's really important to have that understanding before you go close up because there are issues there that you might want to address in your house as well. Now that we all understand all the different kinds of drywall that are out there, let's get busy with the next step. So when I'm bringing drywall into a house, I like to stack it up against the wall, not on the floor. And that's generally because it keeps it a lot cleaner. Um, you'll end up using it as a ladder and it's just not necessary. If you're using a drywall lift to put your drywall in position, you don't want anything on the floor in the room. That's what I like to use. I'm a big fan of using the machine to lift my ceilings in place. Now, I know I'm gonna get a lot of comments from contractors out there going, oh, we just lift it up and hold it. Somebody else screws the board. And that's great if you got two or three guys on your crew. But this system works amazing for homeowners. You might be by yourself or have one guy helping you and you're not used to working with it. You don't want to be lugging that around and causing yourself injury because you're using muscles you don't usually use. So rent a drywall lift if you need to. And if you want to see a video about drywall lifts and some of the different ones that are on the market, check the description below because I went out and I bought the one that was for sale on Amazon. And we did a comparison test between the North American made product and the one that comes across from China. And you're going to be surprised at that result. 
uh, it's worth a look. But anyway, let's get back to this. I like to bring my drywall into the room and put all the short ones on the wall first. Because the shorter the drywall, the less important it is to my installation and usually gets installed last. So I put my 8s first, then my 10s, then my 12s. The reason for this is I'm going to start installing my biggest part of my ceiling first, which is all my 12 footers. And then I'm going to install my other ceiling, which is all my 10 footers. And then when that's all done, I'll come back with the 8s and I'll do little touch ups. I put it on the longest wall because this is the one that can stay till the very end. And if there's a couple of sheets left over, I can set them aside. And then we'll put those on later. But I have all my drawers in one place. Now my cart can go anywhere in the room, and I don't have you know obstacles, and I don't have things to trip over, and I'm not constantly moving drywall from one section to another while I finish the house. So put it all in one spot, have one place to work, and you're golden. Now, all right. So when this stuff gets delivered, it's going to come generally in groups of two like this. Sometimes you know that'll come in singles, but most of the time it comes in groups. And it has a piece of cardboard underneath the paper, and it's designed to tear that paper off so that the sheets can be separated. So generally speaking, you got three options for delivery. One is you go there with a the truck and you pick it up yourself. Now, you need a whole lot of truck to be able to put 12 foot sheets of drywall in there without having an accident on the way home. And an average renovation space like this is 20 to 30 sheets. So it's a lot of weight. I generally try to have it delivered and I have a truck. So, and I know in some of my videos, I've harped a little bit about on the box stores because of their prices. But when it comes to building materials like drywall, Generally speaking, the Home Depot and the Lowe's are the greatest deal in town. They have the lowest price per sheet. Now, if you're just going in for a few sheets and you get a great deal, you throw in your truck, you drive home, great. If you're looking for long ones and you're getting it delivered, then you start looking at options. You might be able to go to a drywall contracting firm where all they do is drywall delivery and installation, and you can get a price there. Now, their price per sheet is going to be a lot higher, but they have additional delivery services that you want to balance out when you're looking at that. They'll put it on a truck and sometimes they'll not just deliver it to the driveway, but they'll walk it right into the house for you for about a buck a sheet or even better. Sometimes it's 50 cents. So check your, your, your competition in the area you live in because you might be able to get a deal where the overall cost of the project is lower if you buy more expensive drywall and get better service. And the reason is this. Carrying 30 sheets of drywall off the truck and into your own house sometimes can take an hour or two. It's exhausting and you might find yourself too tired to finish working for the rest of the day. So if you want to be effective and efficient, you can have it delivered and have a couple of young bucks come running it in the house and drop it on the wall for you. You just got to tell them how you want it set up and they'll do it for you. You're good to go. Then you take your drywall lift and you can get everything installed in the same day and it's not quite so exhausting. So we're going to just demonstrate a couple of tips here on ways to lift and carry your drywall. That'll help reduce fatigue and it'll make sure that the wind won't blow it away on you. Here we go. We're just going to pick it up together, straight up, and I'm going to turn around and reverse my hands. Now it looks a little awkward at this point, but what you'll see is my, aim, my arm creates a slope, okay, so that I can hold the top of the drywall like this, and what Matt's going to be doing is he's going to be holding it a certain way so that he's not fighting with me. If you're not carrying it in the same direction with the same slope, then you're always twisting and pulling and you're going to hurt your back. So I can walk around, I can open doors as I'm working, everything like that, no problem at all, okay? So you'll see the way that Matt's carrying it, his hand is turned the other way, but he's also got the same angle. Okay, so if I'm carrying it this way, it's, we're, we're fighting with the drywall the whole time we're walking. So that's why both of us carrying it with our arms out creates that natural slope. And then if you get around, you, got, you can duck and get around with obstacles, no problem, right? Now, come on back, and then we're going to flip it because we want always have the drywall with the white paper facing you when you're measuring and cutting. The way you flip it if you're on end-to-end -end with a long sheet is quick or it might snap. Ready? Go. Okay, there we go. Whew, that's precarious. The other way to flip it is to work into the middle a little bit, and then we can both flip it together. Work on the sheet. This is cheesy. Just make sure you keep your back straight and you'll be fine. Now let's set it back in. Now, when you're carrying 12 foot sheets of drywall, if they can be heavy. Put your knee out. All right, now what we've got here is friction. So as long as you're putting a little bit of pressure on this drywall, you don't have to carry it. You just create a little bit of friction and you can control the drop, okay? So that way you're not gonna be slamming it on the ground and dropping it. Nobody has to work too hard. Now, 
Now we've got all our drywall in place, the white paper's facing out, ready to measure and cut. All right, so now it's time for measuring and cutting. Now listen, if you've learned anything in this video so far, feel free to take two seconds and give us a quick thumbs up and let YouTube know that we've done a good job in informing you of some new stuff. Now it's basically step two, right? We're gonna move on with installing this stuff. So bear with this, because we're gonna start off with the most important decision you're gonna make in your drywall installation, and that is where to start. Generally speaking, when you're dealing with drywall, you wanna start with the ceilings, but I want you to listen to what I gotta say here, because you wanna resist the temptation to just start against the outside wall, and here's why. If you've been a fan of this channel at all, and you heard me say this before, you'll never find a room that's square. Now drywall, is square. So here's your room. Let's just say we're putting in a nice square room and there's no problems with it and you assume it's square. That means when you put your drywall against that edge on the ceiling it'll be nice and perfect all the way across no gaps right? But in reality your room is probably more like this. And then when you put your drywall against the wall and you've measured from this point to this point and it says 11 feet you cut your drywall square and what you get is this. You get a piece of drywall that goes like this. Now, if you turn that drywall to fit, now your drywall doesn't fit the hole. It's long on one side, big gap on the other side, causes your world to hurt. You're up there on a ladder with your buddy going, oh, it doesn't fit. Somebody tries to do something stupid and jam it in there. You break your drywall and now you got a huge gap. Save yourself all that aggravation. What I want you to do is just start by measuring over 45 or 46 inches, okay? Take that measurement and write it on the wall. We'll call it 11 feet. Move over four feet, take that measurement, okay? And then what you're gonna have is because you're using the short side of the wall, if it's still 11 feet here to here, you're installing it square. Now, the distance here might be 44 on one side and 45 on the other side, but you can cut that because your sheet's 48 inches wide. So all you do is just start your line just a few inches shy of the width of a drywall and measure both lines and install that sheet first, and then put that into fill. So the rest of this whole room will go in nice and square. And generally speaking, one of these walls will be square. And you can take your square and level and you can throw it across your framing and you can double check in a corner to see how it's doing. Find the one corner that's the most square and work off of that one, okay? But to make your life simple, because it's really hard to measure a perfect piece of drywall the first time, just start 44 inches in and then off you go. What we're gonna do, Matt, if you could just do that. So when you're communicating with somebody else in the room, and let's say there's two of you working, you've got a friend helping to hang your drywall, what you wanna do is establish, you know, which wall is your, your, your level wall, okay? So we have a beam that's supporting the open space in this house. So this is our beam. All right, so when I'm asking for a measurement, I'm asking first from the beam out and then from the beam out, right? And I'm gonna say uh, this wall here has a door and this one has a window. So we can communicate, right? So when I'm dr making my drywall here, I'm gonna be taking this sheet, putting it over and lifting it up so I can write door side. And I know when he's giving me a measurement that this door side this is gonna be the square side. That's gonna be the cut end because we're gonna pick it up and go like this and install it this way, okay? I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but let's try that one more time. The door is over here. So we're gonna pick the sheet up, rotate it, just like in the picture, and lift it up. So my, my door symbol would be on that part of the drywall. So when I'm installing this, the other end here ends up down here. On the square wall, we're not cutting. We're gonna cut the other side in case these dimensions are different. So, so we're gonna just measure this together. Now we're measuring based on this floor joist because this floor joist is 45 inches in the room, which is a perfect location. Okay, Matt, mm. right to the stud. What's my actual measurement? Uh, 134 and like seven eighths or something like that. 134 and seven eighths. Okay, so what I'm gonna write is 134, seven eighths. Okay, now we want to move over. One, two, three more studs. Now these joists are actually, uh, three studs, they're joists. These joists are 16 inches apart. 
So if you just count three more, it's actually four feet. It's a great cheat. It's one of the reasons why I love having things strapped because it makes math so much easier. Uh, 135 and a quarter. There we go, all right? That's a huge difference. The other side, down here, it's 135 and a quarter. Important to write these down. Now, you wanna do a little math because the last thing you wanna do is cut this drywall exactly the right dimension. So if this represents the whole dimension, the wall, ceiling, and the wall, you want your drywall to actually come a little bit short of the end. All the way across, well, it's almost a straight line, and then short on the other side. Remember, the drywall is half an inch thick. So, if you're a quarter inch shy over here and a quarter inch shy over here, that makes it a lot easier to install. And the next sheet that goes up is going to come out past that point. All right, and it's gonna go in horizontal, but you're gonna have a nice solid joint there, so you don't have to worry about being perfect. Drywall is not finished carpentry, it's drywall. So you really wanna take advantage of the opportunities you have to cut these short spaces so that the install goes nice and simple. All right, so this becomes a half an inch shorter. So we're taking a quarter inch from each side. So you take half an inch off of that. Now, this is fractions, I know, it's math, right? This is gonna be crazy. Half an inch in eighths is actually four eighths. So you take that off, it leaves you three eighths. So we're gonna end up with 134 and three eighths. On the other side, we got 135 and a quarter. That ends up being 134 and three quarters. So because these numbers are different, we're gonna to wanna to put the mark at the top and the bottom and then connect the dots. Now, this is a really old house. And as a result, I'm not surprised that they're different. Now this is our new tool we're gonna to introduce. It's the T-square for drywall. And if you put that point, it sits on the, on the drywall, right on my mark. Now I am a good, I'm about a half an inch off down here. So there's options for cutting and you'll see in drywall videos, people will take their tape measure and they'll take their knife, they'll extend the blade a little bit and they'll basically hold the knife to the tape, okay? And then they can, measure and they can cut. And you can set this up. If I wrote the door on the other side of the drywall, I'd be cutting on this end. And they, you can set this up where your finger is actually the guide. And then you just pinch the drywall at the measurement you want and you can cut a straight line with the knife, okay? And that works great when you're making square cuts. But in situations like this, you can't use the tape. You can't cheat. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use our square and we're going to just move the bottom of that to connect the dots, use our toe to hold it in position, draw a line with a pencil. The reason you want the pencil is when you're working like this, sometimes it's difficult to keep everything where you want it. So having a visual guide to make sure that you're still on track is a good thing. Okay, now we just press it against the drywall and we're lightly cutting the paper, okay? This is not an exercise of trying to cut all the way through the board. Now, very important to have a really sharp knife here. I recommend the Ofen knife. I'm not getting paid to say this. I've just been using them for years. It's adjustable, it's retractable, they have a snap-off blade, and you get a lot of life out of this. So this one blade is gonna do all the drywall in this whole room. Because what you're doing is you're cutting the paper. Remember, drywall is paper with all the compressed gypsum in between the two layers. As long as you can cut the paper, You'll break the board, no problem. Now, the way you break this after you put the score, is just, that's it, a little bit of a wiggle, all right? Nothing to it. Now, if you fold the drywall back like this, you got control of it, it's not gonna fall over. Now, the reason we always have the white paper facing the front is it leaves a nice clean line. And when I break that drywall, the part that I'm looking at and that I'm working with with my mud is nice and clean. If I cut from the brown side, okay, and I break it, and something goes wrong, or my knife gets dull, I end up with a bunch of these kind of pieces of paper tearing off. Now, when I go to finish my drywall, I can't tape that. I'd actually gotta come by and tear every single piece of that off all the way down the edge, all right? So in order to avoid that, always have the white side out and cut that. Then you step back behind the drywall with your knife from the bottom to the top, and you're cutting through just paper. Now you're sticking your blade all the way through, but you're only cutting paper because the gypsum's out of the way. And then grab both sides so they don't fall over. 
set the garbage to the side. There we go. Now it's ready for installation. All we have to do is assemble our drywall lift, throw it up in the ceiling. All right, so just before you put your drywall on the ceiling, you want to take one more look and you want to get measurements. So anything that you have to use a cutout tool after the fact. Now this is why I'm suggesting you use a cutout tool. Boxes like this, they're an issue. You have electrical fixtures, you have heat ducts, you can have fans, all kinds of different protrusions through the drywall when it's finished. Generally speaking, you want to cut those out with a cutout tool after you install the drywall. Because if you try to measure exactly the location onto that drywall based on where it goes up, you're going to be really disappointed. Remember, we're leaving a little bit of gap on each side. The world isn't perfectly square, even if we think it is. The drywall is square. Your cutting might not be straight. There's so many variables that leaving all of the cutouts until after it's installed is your best bet. So what you want to do is you want to measure the center mark of this fixture, center line, and you want to write it on your plastic wall. You can't drywall without a marker. I'm telling you right now, this is like the most important tool. 58 inches, okay. So at around the 58 inch mark, I'm going to put an arrow. Okay, I'm going to put 58. And then I'm going to measure from the other side. 45. And then I'm going to put this arrow. 45. Doesn't look like much, but as soon as I put this sheet up, I'm going to check my wall. Okay, and I'm going to draw this and mark that spot on the drywall for a future cutout tool. Now I think we'll show that on the video right away anyway, but the point is your system should be check where your sheet's going, make sure any protrusions you've got labeled and marked, and then the next sheet over, you can always take a pencil and mark it on the drywall right where the, next to where the protrusion is, and you can just follow that system one sheet at a time, nice and methodical, don't be in a hurry and bury everything. That's generally how drywallers do it, they go so quick, they always miss something. Take it easy, make notes, think twice, double check, now you can proceed. So here's our, our drywall lift. Um, these products are um, generally available at a lot of tool rental stores. You can just rent them for the day or just a few hours if that's all you need it for. Paragron Pro Manufacture Company is actually one that makes this. This is made in the USA, solid steel. It's an amazing tool. And if you haven't seen the other video where we discussed the difference between this and the cheap junk that's available on Amazon, I actually bought one just to check it out. And we did a video on the differences, pros and cons. You've really got to check that out. I'm just going to whip this together and start putting up the drywall while Matt goes out to buy our lunch. Just a quick note, before you go sticking your drywall on and closing your ceiling, make sure you've made a map of all of your electrical. <laughs> you need to know the exact center locations for after the fact so you can drill your holes for all your pot lights. Crucial. Now, let's just recap. We've got our drywall, we've got it cut, we've got it measured, we know it's square in the room. We're going about 44 inches off. The fixture we're going to cut out is written on the wall. So in reality, this drywall can go pretty much anywhere within a few inches, right? As long as it fits in the hole, it doesn't matter where it lands, we're going to be just fine. This is the benefit of my system. You don't have to be perfect in your location. You just want to get it roughly in the area. Keep an eye on things, try to keep them Relatively square, all right, boom, boom, boom. Now, we were trying to go off this floor joist here, or give or take about that spot. Now I know I'm less than 48 inches to the wall, good. We'll go a little bit tighter. I've tucked all of my wires up, so there's not gonna be any problem there. All right, now I just wanna make sure my gap here is straight and it's not, and this is my key. If the gap on each side of this drywall to my header is the same, I know I'm going in somewhat square. So I'm just gonna make a couple of modifications before I put too much tension on it. I like that. And then the last thing I gotta do is give it a little bit of tension, push it up there nice and tight. Now nothing's gonna go anywhere. I'm free to go get my tools and screw that on. So here's the thing, I just went out and I bought a new dimpler bit from DeWalt and it goes spring-loaded, does a great job. You throw in your screw and generally speaking, the idea is it sets the screw deep enough that it is recessed so it's not too proud so you can fill it with mud and it doesn't break the paper. And the way you can test that is you use a 5 one just rub over top of it. There's no clicking sound. You hear that? If it clicks, it's not deep enough. So then you can adjust this just by turning the head. You can turn the head in and out and then you set the wheel behind it to snug it up, right? Anyway. I just wanted to show you that because 
that's a nice little tool. And I picked that up so that, you know, we'd have some options. But I also went out and picked up a new tool for Matty. He doesn't own a screw gun yet. And so this is a drywall screw gun. It's a very specific tool. It's generally only for drywall. And it has a adjustable neck as well. And so it's very quick. And so you can turn the motor on. The tip doesn't spin until you put pressure on it. All right. And then that's not deep enough, obviously. So then you adjust your head until you get what you want out of it. That's too deep. So I'm just going to play around here a little bit until I get the right depth setting. Nope. Still not deep enough. So I'm going to turn one more click. Oh, maybe. I'm liking that. It's just barely though, so I'm going to throw one more on there. There. Perfect. Now it's set in place. One little suggestion I have is, uh, Matt, actually, can you grab the electrical tape? Take a little bit of electrical tape and wrap it on the chuck now. Now that you have the depth set, there's no need to fine tune it. There's no situation the need for that will change. So I'm going to take care of that right now. Now I got that taped on. It's good to go forever and ever, ever. Amen. And listen, uh, this particular tool is like only 80 bucks. And the way you hold it is it has like a pistol grip. So you're always pushing right up through the screws and you're not going to slip off. And you just use the, your last couple fingers. That runs the trigger. Nice and easy. Now it's corded, which means it's a good deal. All right, 80 bucks. Hello. If you're drywalling and you don't have power in the house, then you're probably in brand new construction. You might need to get a corded, cordless version, but that's like 300 or so. So I prefer to go with corded, especially for home renovations. This is a great tool upgrade for a homeowner because it's one of those things that if you have, you can make really quick work of this job and it's going to be a perfect screw every time. And you're not going to be adjusting and fiddling around and breaking through paper and causing all those problems associated with just using a hand drill. Definitely won't buy one. If you want to buy any of these tools, the lift, the drills, the little bits, you can go to our web page now. The link's in the description. We've got a brand new affiliates link there. So we got affiliates for all kinds of different companies. So feel free to do your shopping there. There should be some deals available. Everybody's got different prices on different things. So you can do some comparative shopping, but we just put together a little bit of a resource for you to help make your shop easier. Another quick tip. If you find a hardware store that sells screws in bulk, you just pay by the pound. It's half price when you go to the store and you buy them in these little plastic containers. Uh-huh, half price. The best part of using a screw gun in this situation is it's really super quick and you don't run the risk of having any problems with puncturing the paper. So now for the next sheet. Um, you'll notice that when you screw the drywall in, now you have the strapping is marked with this drywall. Now across here, we need a mark. And this is again where this black marker comes in handy. Put a nice big black line under each one of these strapping on the plastic and you won't have any issues with knowing where to attach your drywall. So as long as you put a screw on this, each strap on this sheet and you mark with the marker on this side, you'll know all your locations for putting in the next sheet. So here we get into something a little bit more tricky because we're putting in a sheet that's going to get cut. It's not a full eight feet, four feet across. So when you're cutting your sheet down, you really want to be cutting where it's comfortable up here. It's a lot easier to cut here and break it and trim it than at the bottom, obviously. That means this is now going to be my factory edge on the ceiling. So last time we took the sheet and we basically lifted it up like this, right? And that would make this the cut side if we did that again. So now I've got to do this. I got to flip it around. So you're going to get very confused. So this is where knowing where the door is and marking it on this is going to be very important. So this is going to be the door side where I'm going to be cutting off. Okay. So I'm going to put the cut side here. So now I got to visualize grabbing this sheet and going the other way. All right. That makes left, right and right, left. <laughs> very odd. So our measurement on where the, where the joint is, is 134 and 3 eighths. We're going to put that number down here now. Okay. The cut side, I wrote down 133 and 3 quarters. Okay. And just for safety's sake, this is my beam. Okay. 
So when we're picking it up, we're picking it up like this, and that beam goes over there behind us, and that whole cut side will be on the outside. That actually makes sense. And the reason you have to be very careful here is because the cut line at each end are different measurements, and it's so easy to get them reversed, and then you cut the wrong angle, so you end up with it doesn't fit on one side and it's a huge gap on the other side. The right side of the sheet I wrote down is 42 and 3 eighths. That's over there. And that's at this end. 42 and 3 eighths from here. <laughs> and the other end is 42 and 3 quarters. Okay, so now we have all that figured out. So we're just going to draw that line on the angle again like we did last time. Now, here's the thing. Five and a quarter is how much we're cutting off on this side. And five and a half on the other side. Now, it might seem like a small thing, but if we take our total amount, which is what, 140 something, Matt? 134? 65, around here. That's about the center of the board. If we make a mark here, five and a quarter, five and a half, the difference is five and three eighths. Okay. Then I can go like this. With the pencil, I can hold it on five and, five and a quarter. And I can start drawing five and a quarter and slowly bring my pencil down to five and three eighths where it hits the middle. Right about here. And then slowly bring it down the marker to five and a half. Bam. So I've drawn a straight line that's actually on an angle over 11 feet. It's a great trick. If you can get good at that, now you can freehand cut this. Just trace it out with a knife. Bring your blade out about a half an inch. Remember, we're only cutting the paper. So you don't have to use a lot of pressure. You don't have to go deep. You just got to get that nice sharp blade in the paper. And then just set your hand your fingers up against the drywall and all you do is instead of looking at the blade look an inch in front of it and as long as you're looking at the at the pencil mark you'll find your blade will almost instinctively cut that mark within a millimeter or two it's not going to be an issue because remember we've already taken off about a quarter inch or so off that measurement to allow the wall board to cover the gap and you can do the same thing on this edge because this is on an angle if you make the mark with your pencil, okay, all you got to do is get close. Doesn't have to be perfect. If you make a mistake, make it on the short side. It's easier to fill. Okay, we break that. A nice clean cut. Then we start down here. It gets really big. It's hard to manage. Now you can cut this from both sides. Just be cautious and be aware of where the blade is the whole time. Okay, go. About there-ish. How's that feel? Yeah, it's pretty balanced. I'm gonna extend my arm here. Okay. One thing to remember is try to leave the handle and the wheel facing you when you're going tight to the wall. All right, there we go. We'll drive that up. Let it bounce around a little bit. Now, once we get close, now it's time to worry about that. We're up there. Nice. If you're not afraid of the noise, these awesome guns have got a little trigger set on here, so it leaves the motor on the whole time. And the only time the tip spins is when there's compression. So don't mind me. All right, so now we're gonna talk about installing the walls. We're gonna get three measurements here. The top, the middle, and the bottom. Because we're putting our sheets in horizontally, those are the three numbers that we're gonna need. 134 and a half, exactly. 134, what we'll go with. We'll reach up as high as I can go. 133 and three quarters. Okay, and the bottom. Unbelievable. 
<laughs> I've always found it's best practice uh. all right, to get me all these measurements. We're going to treat that corner like it's uh, square. Actually, we're going to treat this one like it's square. Because this one is, that one actually slopes in. One of my tips for my system is using the plastic as a way to make notes, right? So I'm going to get Matt to just write down all the dimensions from this corner, which we're going to call square, because we put a level on it. And we'll measure right to left in these cases where we want the drywall to end, okay? We'll put the number here so that we can translate that information. We're going to go tight to the ceiling from a factory edge, so we can also measure from the ceiling down to the header, mm. okay? Get me those two points as well. You do all of that, I'm going to start translating this information from the full sheet and I'll cut the board. That's quite a work on this floor. Eh? Okay, so this box here, it's, it's a live box, right? It's already in place. We, we're not going to use the cutout tool here because we've got a switch attached to it. Mm. Instead of disengaging the wiring and putting it all back together again, what we're going to do is we're going to take these two screws out, pull this out, twist it. We're going to pre-cut the hole on the drywall for this. Oh, okay. Gotcha. It's not the greatest plan, but it's a good plan for the situation. Mm. Might as well show people how to do that. So we're going to get this measurement, exact measurements for these four corners off that wall and this wall. We're assuming that this is relatively square here, just because we put that stud in with the laser level. We should get pretty close. And I'm going to just take those measurements, I'm going to make the hole a little bit bigger, and then we'll come and install that together. So what we're done here is we've measured the sheet to fit the whole wall. We've measured out where the, the framework ends around the door. Okay, so this all gets cut out. That represents the door. So there's the frame, there's the insulation, and then there's the actual frame in the wall. So you got door jam, insulation, wall frame. We're measuring to the edge of the wall frame, so we don't have interruption with the foam. And then over here, we just marked out where the location of the plug is. And we're going to cut that in advance because it's a live plug and the switch is already attached. This is a system you can use at home if you're drywalling a space that's already finished. The idea here is to cut all this and then, then install it so that it's one piece. We don't have joints around the door because joints around the door are the most likely place you're going to find cracks. Figure that. So if you can eliminate the risk of the crack, you solve the problem before it starts. Yeah. Now this is an old tool. I've been using this for about 12 years now. Drywall saw, the teeth on it, every other tooth, they go in two different directions. So they actually cut the hole a little wider than the blade itself. Makes it really quick and easy to cut holes. Nice and simple, just a few bucks, but having a good hand tool on you, all the difference in the world, right? So Matt's going to mark the ceiling where the studs intersect. Make sure you hit the middle of the stud, that was the outside of the Matt, huh? it's really important to get the middle of the stud, knowing that where you start the pencil is buried by the drywall. So if you do that hockey stick action, we're not going to know where it is. Now, because the door jam is already installed, we're going to cut this in advance of getting over there. All right. We just put our level on the ground here just to create a lever because the, our ground is actually a little warped. So if I had this sitting on the ground and then I cut it out, it might snap the drywall in half because the floor is doing wonky things. Unreal. Now that drywall cutout tool is amazing. Uh, it's a noisy, it's dusty, but man is it efficient. And you can also use it for cutting around all your electrical boxes that don't have wiring yet. We'll show you that in just a minute. Let's get this in place. Nice and easy on this one, okay? Because of the door issue, you want to be more in the middle of that panel. So that you've got a lot of control. Okay. You're over that. Okay, let me put my end up first, and then we'll close it like a door. How's that working? Okay, now you can see how crazy wonky this house is. This is how, how warped everything is, right? Um, how did you measure this? How did you cut it? I gave, I cut it the measurement that's written on the wall. Look at the gap. I'm two inches away from where I should be. Here's the evidence. This is the number that he gave me. Measuring from here across. So that's the number that I cut. The truth is, the stud is at 56 and a half. Because I need the drywall on the wood to attach it. 57. You're on the wrong... How am I going to screw to the wood if you cut it over here? Oh, you told me to measure the edge of the stud. Wrong edge! Oh. We're, we're going to attach it to the wall, dude. Pointed it to the left. This is one of these moments where you just go... Moosefaba. 
Ah, <clears throat> uh, okay, so <laughs> two things happen there. <laughs> One, there is a, apparently a breakdown in communication and we're gonna blame me, that's fine, I get that. But two, the ceiling on this house is so out of whack, the floor is out of whack, there's nothing square to work with here. So in, a, in most homes, you don't deal with the 1880 pain, but here we are. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start on the floor so that we at least have something to measure from. It's kind of the similar concept as the ceiling starting with a second sheet. We put it on the floor, throw it in the corner, that sits nice, so that can be treated like square. And then we're just gonna come over here and we're gonna mark where to cut the board so that we can screw it to the stud. And then, uh, <laughs> bam. So now I'm gonna cut that line. Are you kidding me? Look at that, even this. This is out almost an inch over four feet. Love it, God. Everything is here is so crooked. It's our job to make it look straight. All right. So all that information about measuring, that's all great information, because generally we like to install tight against the ceiling. And that works great if your house is level. But in this case, everything is old and twisted and weird. So it's better for us to work here so we have a nice straight edge that we can measure off of. Because even once we put that sheet in there, we realized we were installing like this. And that same thing happened where things were too long or too short. It's just wacky. Off you go. You do this and I'll measure and cut the next piece. And then we'll be able to measure nice and snug up to the ceiling and all of our points across here. And we'll be able to basically trace out the contour of that ceiling. Unreal. So since I'm installing this drywall first, I'm just translating this information about where that box is. And it's eight inches over and 19 inches up. There we go. And that'll be fine. I'm also gonna need to just remove a little bit of work here for that box. Nice. With a little bit of luck, I'll be able to wiggle this in behind. <laughs> yes, sir. Once you get a couple of screws in, just stop. Get your cutting tool out. We know the middle of that location of the box. Now this particular tool, the tip of it is like a guide point and it doesn't have a cutting wheel on it. So it'll just run around the perimeter. What we do is we puncture the hole, we run to the edge, we hop over the other side of the box and then we keep pressure on the other side of that box until we've traced it out and it cuts through the drywall. Perfect every time. Okay. Woo! So here's how we do this. Boom. That's close to the middle. Six feet. Right there. All right. <laughs> In this situation, and I mean, if you could do this kind of drywall installation, whatever you face, you're going to be fine. If you have square and you have level, you have a lot of advantage. If you don't, and you're working in an old house like this, you've really got to use your noggin, and you've got to have a laser level. What I'm gonna do, I've marked out six feet exactly on that drywall. Bam, there's my mark. Now here's the best part. There we go. There's my six foot mark, right here, okay? Six feet. Now what I'm gonna do, and I took my six foot mark on it, okay? There we go, all the way up and down. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to take our measurements from the wall, from that line, measuring at the bottom of the drywall, which will be my finished edge, to the edge, to the corner, which is six feet, because we measured from there. So I know that's six feet. I'm gonna take it from the top, measure to the outside corner. So now we're gonna measure from our six foot mark over to the corner. All right, so it's 71 and a half. That's just a half inch less than six feet. So now I'm gonna translate that information over to this side. I know, I gotta take a half an inch off here to zero. And we're gonna just do this over and over and over again, measuring all of the elements on that wall, whoop, based on that center line, using the center line and the drywall as our level. This sounds kind of complicated, but the reality is if we have a horizontal line and we have a center line and we measure everything up and then off, 
we can find every point around the outside of that perimeter of that sheet of drywall, including cut out around the door. And we can cut all that out first and then just set it in place perfectly. What we want to do is create a multitude of points for taking measurements from. This one's just over four feet. Don't need a measurement. Just over four feet. That one's exactly four feet. And I'm okay if there's a little gap at the top of the sheet. I'm not concerned about it because we'll be able to fix that later. It's not ideal, but in this scenario, nothing is going to be ideal. Just under four feet. Okay, so far so good. We know the other sheet of drywall comes up a little bit. So over here we're down to four and a half, 47 and a half inches, 47 and a half inches. So the, the, the ceiling definitely drops here a little bit. So I'm taking a half an inch off the top over here because this whole side drops. Now that I've got a, a level edge, you can see how it, at the tape, it just it pops down there, right? Amazing, eh? So we're following this, Phew. drops right here. So we're gonna, we're gonna cut that drop in and we're gonna continue measuring off of this line at the bottom of the sheet to cut around the door and the plug. <sighs> Once we get that all done, then we'll be ready to install. So before you let the guy, you can let go now, take off, make sure you get a screw near the top. Otherwise, if somebody comes in the room and opens the door, the air pressure change will pull the drywall right off the wall. You might not be looking. <laughs> I learned that one the hard way. That's tough to <laughs> we are here to talk today about drywall tools and materials, specifically over 40 different things that you should own for sure, you might want to buy, and a few things you might even want to rent to make your life as easy as possible to make a painful job for DIYers rather enjoyable. Number one on the list, of course, is a knife. Now this is the Ulfa HB. It is the wide, fat knife. It has snap-off blades, which is number two. You're gonna want a box of snap-off blades. Now generally, if you're buying a knife for the first time, it'll come with an extra couple blades. I did all of this kitchen and dining area here with one blade. I still have a few snap-off sections left. The secret to cutting drywall, of course, is cut the paper. Don't stick your blade into the chalky middle on the inside and your blades will last a long time. Once you've got that taken care of, you're gonna to wanna to get yourself a carpenter pencil. There's a difference between this and those little, little tiny ones. This lead is really strong, really fat, and will last you a long, long time. So this is what I use to mark my drywall. In the category of tools you must own is a drywall knife. Because if you don't have some of the most professional tools, this will at least give you the ability to cut all the holes and rectangles and big angles and inside outside corners so that you can install your drywall. This one blade here is a lot of teeth that go in two different directions. So when you're cutting, it doesn't have a lot of friction. So speed is important, right? Not how hard you're pushing. And that is the secret to using that. Of course, when you're dealing with drywall, a must have is a mask. Not so much for when you're installing it, but when you're sanding it. So there are two masks that I would recommend. One of them is one of these bad boys here. A mask like this is worth about 60 bucks. Rechargeable, replaceable filter, sorry, on the end. They're about $15 a pop, but it will last you for months and months, even if you're working on a regular basis. This one here, this is from Moldex, and I've got this linked on our Amazon page. This mask is awesome. It's a, got the vent here, okay? So I can actually wear this. I can actually wear this and still talk. Now I don't have a nose piece to pinch because it's built in. This is actually formed for your bridge of your nose. It's actually, it's really cool, right? So you don't have to worry. This has a much higher performance value than those masks that have the little breathable pinch nose thing on it. They're garbage, right? They only filter out about 50% of your air. This gets up in the 85 to 90 range, all right? This is the 99.99, but this is a pretty good substitute for occasional dust now you can get about 10 of these things in a box and it's pretty affordable. So I definitely want to get you a mask. As far as the workhorse, you definitely need a tape measure. If you're working with metal studs, make sure you get a tape measure that has a magnet on the end because then you can reach out, magnet to the stud and then pull your reading. If it's not a magnet, any tape will do. Make sure it's high vis and it has a pretty decent standout so that you can grab things across the room and then pull the tape tight to measure. Okay. 
Next two things go hand in hand. You must have drywall corners. I've never seen a room in my entire life that didn't have at least one corner on it. <laughs> so suggest you buy outside metal corners instead of the paper beads. The paper beads are available. It's more for situations where you don't have framing and you're floating a corner and you don't have anything to nail or screw to. And just a pair of simple metal cutters like this, aviation snips, straight ones, all right? You can cut this corner with ease. Now, you also need to install your drywall. So you're gonna need a drill and you're gonna at least need a Phillips bit I recommend these little gizmos here. This has got a depth setter on it and you can get a package of two of these for like five bucks. That's also on the Amazon line. Being able to have a depth set with your screw is so important because if you break through the paper, you aren't actually holding anything. And it will just cause you a lot of grief because when you mud it and paint it, it'll keep popping and you'll get bumps and chips and it's a mess. The other thing you're gonna need are screws, all right? Regular half inch drywall takes one and a quarter inch screw. If you're using 5.8 drywall for any kind of soundproof application, then I would suggest getting the one in 5.8. And if you're going with the second layer, the second layer will need a two inch screw. If you buy your screws at a hardware store where you can buy a whole bag full and you buy by the pound, you will get twice as many screws as you would if you go to the hardware store where they sell it in a little plastic container. Just a thought. A couple of pounds of screws here is 12 bucks. A couple of pounds at the hardware store in that bucket is 25. Okay, the other thing you're gonna need, and I think this is a must have because this makes it possible for you to cut and measure your drywall. It sits right on your edges and allows you to score straight lines with your knife. I put that on my must have list, although if you're a contractor, you're probably going, we don't do that. Where I'm from, we just take out our knife, take our measuring tape, hold the knife to the side of the tape, find the edge of the drywall and use my finger as a guide, right? And you cut like that. I get it. I don't suggest a homeowner doing some drywall work on the weekend is gonna be very proficient with this technique. So do yourself a favor and get yourself a square because that will help you immensely. And if you wanna see how that is used, we do have a video outlining all the details of how to use that tool and all the options available. We'll put a card up here with a link in the description as well. You can go and check that one out. Now, that takes us to a place where now we have our drywall installed, almost. One other thing I'm gonna suggest is some kind of foot pedal. Because when you're doing drywall, we put the ceilings on first, and then we hang the second sheet nice and snug up against the ceiling, and then we put the bottom sheet on. And if you're in most places in the world, the second sheet of drywall, even after it's installed, has a bit of a gap. So you put this underneath that drywall like a foot pedal, and you can step on it and lift your sheet up nice and snug. This kind of a snug joint right here, allows you to have a nice, easy finish. If there's a huge gap, it adds an extra step, adds extra material, adds extra time. So for five bucks, you can have this and lift your drywall. It also acts as a rasp, so when you cut your drywall, you can clean your edges up if necessary. Kind of a handy tool to have. Now that leads us to taping. And then we're gonna be done with the must-haves in just a moment. Paper tape. If you have paper tape, you can tape anything. Inside corners, outside corners, butt joints, factory joints, you can do anything with this stuff, okay? You gotta have paper tape. You also are gonna need a four inch knife because that's how you apply the tape. That's how you do your corners. That's how you apply your mud on all your inside corners, okay? And then you're gonna need one of these, a 10 inch by four inch straight blade, not the curved ones, straight, okay? And if you wanna watch our video series on how to tape, you can also click that link, check it out in the description below. But we got a taping series set aside for you to show you my system for homeowners for taping, which is foolproof. It's not like what you've seen on TV. I don't use really weird tools. These two and a hawk, this little flat piece of aluminum pan, if you have these three tools, you can tape like a pro. We'll show you how in the other video. Now, now that we've got the ability to measure and cut and install and tape, wow, that's everything you need to know. The only thing that's left is sanding. Still a big fan of the Radius 360. I have it on my extension pole. Okay, so nice and simple, nice round head. It's got a spongy core. And this will do a nice job of finishing and changing the texture of the mud to be very similar to the paper. So after you've primed, you don't see the difference. And then when you paint, your walls will look amazing. Now moving on. 
options. That's the must have. What you could have is different tape. You could have regular fiberglass tape. Okay? You could have ultra thin fiberglass tape. That's right, this is available in a thinner version. So when you're taping your butt joints, you can now use fiberglass instead of paper if you prefer, because fiberglass you can install with a quick set mud, and then you can get your second and third coat all in the same day. So if you're doing a small space, using ultra thin fiberglass tape on your butt joints allows you to finish the job much quicker. They also have fiberglass tape for wet areas. They also make a mud just for wet areas, although if you're doing a shower and you're using green drywall board, just keep your colors the same. Green drywall, green tape, and don't use mud in the shower. I always suggest using a cement. Use your, use your tile cement when you're taping with this in the shower. And then we also have, from fiber tape, the flexible corner bead. This is a cool product because you can just cut off the piece that you need. Ready for this? And it has a, a joint here already made. Okay, and you just fold your corner. Instant outside corner. And it gives you a nice beveled edge, right? Very similar to a metal corner bead in this situation. Okay, now, this is kind of cool just to have in the box in case you ever need it, right? It's that last minute, I gotta roll the corner bead right here just in case. What are you, like three feet short or you got a tricky spot? You can peel that, you can apply the uh, drywall compound, stick it in, use your four inch knife, press down the edges, and then fill in from that ridge. And it's strong enough that you can actually use your metal tools on it and treat it like a metal corner bead. That stuff is money in the bank if you ever run into trouble. But I'll be honest with you, my favorite is right here. Let me get you a piece of this. Bum, 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 bum. Now, this is very similar. Okay, this one also folds. Okay, the difference is this one folds into a bunch of different angles, both directions. Okay, now where that tape won't do that, it'll only do an inside corner. This one does outside corners. And now, this is an interesting cardboard compound, and the back side of this here has got a texture on it, so it really holds the mud incredibly well. So you can make an inside or an outside corner, right? That would be an inside corner. You just fold it the other way, be an outside corner. Done. You could do 45 corners. You know like those old houses with the sloped ceiling? You can set this up so it'll go here and then on an angle. And then what happens is this corner right here, inside, it actually, it fits the corner of the knife. Okay, see that? And it's a guide. And you can scrape that nice and tight. And then when it's dried, you come from the other side. And you get a perfect corner. Hence the word. This is called Perfect 90. <laughs> it's amazing. And if you are in creative situations, having a box of that around is really, really, really handy. Now, let's get rid of that. Ah, we got all of our tapes done now. Okay. There we go. Let's talk tape. Because you don't have to just pull it off the roll and have it hanging around. This is a great little two-in-one applicator for the fiberglass mesh. And the way this works is you start here and it's just on a roller. And you can just press it into the wall, run down to the corner. The other thing it does is you can pop this corner out, pop the wheel out. Now watch this. Remember I showed in another video how to use mesh corner and the tape in the corner, sorry. All right, look at this mess. Tell me that isn't brilliant. Done. Now for everybody out there who is hating on me in that video, you can't use mesh in the corner. They didn't make this because you can't, right? The reality is, is if you're gonna use mesh in a corner, you gotta use the right mud. That takes us to the next product we're gonna show. Sheetrock 45. Huh. Because I live in Canada and I have Sheetrock Company, all right? We also have CGC, we have Certainty, we have a lot of different drywall manufacturing products out there. So. The, the brand name is not as important as the number 45. There are a lot of companies making a 45 minute mud, which is rhetorical because it usually takes longer than that for it to actually dry. But if you add some hot water, it can be done in 40 minutes. If you have uh, well water, it can be done in 20 minutes. But the point is this, 
That's a quick setting compound. It's got a chemical reaction. It bonds to the mesh and the drywall incredibly hard, all right? And it does not tear and crack. If you use ultra-purpose ultra mud or regular purpose mud or machine mud with that mesh tape, you're gonna have a problem. But with the 45, it works amazing. The other tool you might wanna have is this. This little gizmo here, you can put your paper tape in so that if you're working on a ladder, you just set this bad boy in your pocket and you have access to your paper tape. You can cut it, stick it in, finish, let it go, move around, grab it again, and it's right there ready to go. Handy dandy. Okay, moving along. Um, things you might want other than a metal corner. I grabbed this from the drywall store the other day. And what this is, is an inside corner intersection, okay? And they make the pieces, just like the metal corner bead, out of plastic, and they, they join together, kind of like Lego. It's awesome. So you can stick these on the wall and have perfect rounded corners, okay? You don't have to go with a square corner. You can go with rounded corners. That's an option as well. I'm not a big fan of the rounded corners, but they do make tools now for putting on the outside. So it's a rounded corner, outside corner trowel, and they make all of these little gizmos here now, so you can get really nice finished corners that aren't gonna crack. When they first came out with rounded corners, we got a lot of tiny little cracks around, but nowadays with this little invention here, you're crack free, and it's the way to go. Now when you're installing your metal corners, a lot of people use screws. Drives me nuts. Purpose of this demonstration, I'm gonna show you this. Whoop. Here's a screw, and here's a drywall corner bead now, right? Now, there's a row of holes in a corner bead, and then there's a row of exterior holes. That's where the fasteners go, not down the big holes in the middle, all right? When you put your corner bead on, the first half an inch that you've got there material-wise is other drywall. There's nothing there to fasten to. So you always use the fasteners on the outside of the bead, but the difference between the screw and the nail is, when you put the nail on, it's flat. The screw always has a raised head. It's not designed for use with the corner bead. Okay, so when you're putting that on, you wanna to go to the store and buy a box of these. Drywall ringed nails. And that is the secret to success, which means you'll need a hammer, but no big deal. Everybody owns a hammer. And then you just tap that into the framework and you're good to go. You won't have any problems. Next on the list, a knife. That's right, you need a second knife. Because <laughs> if you're like me, you're gonna lose the first one halfway through the day. So have two of these bad boys. <laughs> okay, more options. Laser level. This is for throwing a line on your wall, okay? And this is for every time you have a scenario where things aren't square. You can drop one of these lines down and have a point on your wall or on your ceiling that you can measure from to help make sure that your cuts are perfect. Now, that's a trick to learn, but honestly, if you're gonna be doing a lot of drywall or you just don't like having big gaps everywhere that you gotta fill and patch, buy that. Now, if you do have to fill and patch some big gaps or you have damage, you can always buy this stuff. This is amazing. Now, this is just a fiber fiberglass mesh. It's quite thin. It's a little bit more, a um, little more dense than the fiberglass tape, but this stuff is awesome. So you open up a door and you get a puncture in your drywall. All you do is add some compound and you can stick this over top of the dent. All right. If you have uh, an old house with plaster cracks, okay, then all you do is you pull out your kills, you spray down the plaster crack, add regular drywall compound over top of that once it's dry, stick this on top of that, and you can tape that in and make your wall brand new again. Now, while I'm here, I should do this. Next tip, you can't just use regular compound over that. You wanna spray your kills on that brown paper first. That'll seal up the paper so that when you put the compound on it, it doesn't end up bubbling, which is a great point because every once in a while, especially when you're new at this drywall game, You'll have a weird corner, it'll be triangular or something like that. You'll cut it, but you won't have it in your mind to cut it upside down and backwards. So you go and install it and you'll be like, wow, it fits, but only if the brown side is down. You can screw that in, it'll work just fine. But after you've installed it, spray it with your Kills oil spray, 
okay? And then you can use the drywall compound over top. If you don't, it's gonna bubble and peel that brown paper off and you're in for a disaster. Okay, next thing you should have with you, this is the, the wish list is the rotas. Now remember, you can cut everything with this, but this makes the job flawless. When you're installing drywall, you don't get a perfect cut like that using a cutout tool and then sticking it on the wall, but this cutout tool lets you install the drywall, then cut it out, and it looks like that. Next tool that you don't need but you might want is this right here. This little bit from DeWalt. This is awesome. It's spring-loaded. All right. It's also adjustable and has a locking ring to set the depth. Now, these little tabs here don't really fit in these drills very well. They do have a tendency of falling out. But this one is made just like a regular drill bit and it locks in place. It's also a depth setter, so when you screw in your drywall, it's the perfect depth every time. And how you know that is the perfect depth is just before you put your mud on, you take your tool, check. If you hear any clicking, like, well, they're all done that way. <laughs> if you hear any clicking, trust me, your screw is not deep enough and you want to have one of these, so you can just give it another shot. That'll take care of that. As long as you can run over your screws without making noise, you're ready to tape. The next thing is this clip right here. It doesn't look like much, but there's soundproofing hat channel that this gets clipped into. You screw this to the wall, and then you put on your hat channel, and this is for sound absorption. This helps to eliminate sound transfer from one room to the next, and if you want a really good version of it, right here, the back bar here also has foam on it. If you want to learn how to do that, again, card, description, check it out. The next thing you might want is to go the next step up. Now you can buy this, it's about 80 bucks, comes with a cord. You can get the three or $400 version and you can put your battery from your drill on it, but really it only has one function, installing drywall. It's the same thing, it's a screw gun. It has the same adjustable tip, a little different design, but it has the same function. The other thing that this drill does is it has a little spot down here, a little switch. So you pull the trigger, you flick the switch on, and it stays on. And the motor runs continually, and you put a screw on, and until you put pressure on that, it doesn't turn, right? So it's really quick. You have it on, it's pistol grip, so you're always pushing straight up. You use your last two fingers here as the trigger, and you just set that up, and you can just throw a screw on, and throw a screw on, and just go all day long with this bad boy. It speeds up the drywall installation process by about three times as much when it comes to setting the screws. Alrighty, let me see. What other tools and tricks do we have in our... Ah, yes! For mixing your mud. Let's move this out of the way. You're going to want to have a pail. You're going to want to have one of these mixing paddles. Mine's filthy, but because it sits in water, it still makes perfect mud every time. And I have one of these slow mixer drills. Man, if I had a dollar every time I saw a supposed pro on television not using one of these to mix their compound, this is a heavy-duty, slow-moving drill. And it will mix compound without making a bloody mess because when you buy it pre-mixed in a box, you got to put it in a pail and add a couple cups of water and mix it up. That makes it creamy and smooth, and it makes the consistency and the texture is such that it reduces sanding. It's worth the weight in gold having this because when it comes time to sand and then do your prime check, you're going to thank me. Speaking of prime check, you're going to want to have trouble light. Grab one of these, it's on a 25 foot cord, it runs about $12 at the Home Depot, right? You throw in a 100 watt light bulb and then you can run around and you can put light from all different angles and check it for all the imperfections after you've put the primer on. Because once you've used your primer, which should have high solid content, the wall should be white. And this will cast shadows on anything that's got not perfect. Then you can just take your four inch and your hawk and go around do touch-ups all day long and make it all look beautiful. Now, if you don't have a hawk for your mud, right, you have a couple of options. You can take a scrap piece of drywall and you can put your mud on it. This is my leftover 45 minute mud, nice and hard, which is why it doesn't crack when you use it with a mesh. And you can work right off of here, all right? This is a little oversized, but you get the idea. Or, you can just about grab anything else that you can find around your house, throw a little mud on there, and you can use it as a... <laughs> you can use that. Run around doing your taping. It's awesome. Now, 
We also have one other thing that you are going to want to have that's not a necessary tool, but if you're working alone, it becomes almost impossible to work without it. And then I'm going to show you a revolutionary new product. It's going to change your life forever when it comes to drywall installation. First, bum bum. Last two things I want to show you. This is for wet sanding, okay? Yes, you can wet sand drywall. The secret here really is this, this coarse plastic material on the outside. You put this in a pail and you squeeze it like this to get the water out. And then you can just rub the wall, right? And it'll get rid of all of the ridges and, and help to work out the scratches. And then you flip it around and you give the wall a quick wipe. And then you wash it and you do the next spot. Now if you're doing a small repair in a finished space like a living room or a kitchen and you don't want dust everywhere, then pick one of these up. It's just a few bucks. It takes a little bit of getting used to to be really good at it, but once you're proficient with the wet sanding, it'll change your life because then you won't have to do all the cleanup afterwards and you won't have to find dust landing on every surface in the house. Now, the other thing is this. These little plastic gizmos here are kind of cute. I don't know why they made them so bloody orange and outrageous, but the point is this. If you're working alone, you can put this underneath your drywall and then carry it, okay? You just set it down here, you lift your drywall, set this underneath, and you can put your hand on top and you can carry your drywall all by yourself. This is a lot safer than having it up over your head and then bending down underneath the doorway as you're walking around, right? Just carry it where you're comfortable. This is only a few bucks and it might be worth its weight in gold. Even if you're working with somebody else, we did another video where I showed you how to carry the drywall. Again, if your arms are sore or you've got elbow issues, this is a great way to just hold everything nice and square. It reduces a lot of the stress on your joints and your muscles. It's a great little tool to have. All right, now, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you, go rent a drywall lift, especially if you're working alone. If you're working with two people, I still recommend it because it'll cut down your risk of injury and nothing slows a project down faster on the weekend than throwing out your back or tweaking your shoulder. Feel free to get it. It'll cost you 40 bucks a day. No big deal. It's worth the money because it'll speed up the installation. It'll help make it flawless and put everything right where you want. And you're not going to end up falling off a ladder or throwing out your back. Okay, definitely worth it. By the time you're done installing your ceilings, the old fashioned way, climb up ladder and holding over your head. Most guys I know that don't do it on a regular basis are already exhausted and ready to take a nap. So if you're going to do your ceilings and have a nice, successful, productive day, rent the tool and then take it back at the end of the day when you're done. It's worth its weight in gold. Now I'm going to show you the revolutionary product that's in this box. Bum, bum, bum. And I'm going to install it so you'll know how to use it too. Because once you've seen this, you're never going to go back to what you used to do. So here's my new product. Now here is a typical drywall exhaust area, okay? I've got my forced air coming through the wall instead of the floor because I love doing that because it blows hot air across the floor instead of up to the ceiling. Seems to make a lot more sense to me. And I've got a product here that traditionally you would just buy a plastic or metal floor grate, stick it in the wall or one of those white plastic reels and screw it on and they all look like garbage. Well, the folks at Airy Event have invented this. This thing is freaking awesome. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna install this, and then I'm gonna open up these dampers to let the air through. <laughs> and then this is here gets installed as a decorative finish. And it snaps into place when you do it right. Okay, there we go. And what, what you can do is you can actually paint all of this. All right? So once this is in place, you can have all of this painted and then it's invisible to the naked eye. So here we go. It fits in It fits in the hole. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Now I knew that I was going to be using this, so I actually framed this whole thing out so that I could install. If you try doing this with drywall screws, you will drive yourself crazy this is of a thicker gauge steel and you're not going to bend that into the wall. So, blue ring nails are an absolute necessity in this situation. Don't try to cheat with screws. It'll make the drywalling process an absolute nightmare. Because the whole wall will be covered in ridges. But if you use the nails, 
You can do this with a couple passes of a four inch knife. I'll just demonstrate this in a second. All right, here's my knife. Here's my pre-mixed mud. Okay, here we go. <laughs> now, I am not using my hawk here. I probably should be. There we are. Okay, there we go. Now, when that is dry, I'll be able to come by with another coat, smooth all that out. And then, if you paint with a sprayer, you can spray all of that and leave this on the ground and spray it as well. If you don't, you can just install it and then hit it with the roller. <laughs> now, if you're using a really wild color, you might want to roll this separately and hit all these other sides. But here we go. We just stick this in. Boom, there we go, heat vent. Now how sexy is that? Hey, it's Jeff from Home Renovation, and you know, our YouTube channel is generally designed to give people lots of ideas, tips, tricks, advice, construction technologies, on how to do renovations at home. But today we're kicking it a little bit old school. We are gonna go back, and I'm taking care of the drywall taping today, doing corners inside, outside first, second coats. We're gonna go through the whole process as I tape through this room, and I'm gonna show you how to do it with some basic tools. We're gonna to go back to just the old fashioned. I've got my hawk, I've got a four by 10 knife, I got my four inch, I got my kill spray, I got a knife and paper tape and a drill, that's it. If you have this, well, plus the bench. <laughs> if you've got this set up, you can tape like a pro, and we're gonna show you how, so let's just get right into it. So the first step you've got when you're taking care of your drywall job is your preparation. It's, uh, it's a necessary evil because you want to make sure you've gone through the whole room, taking care of all the issues, because a lot of the repairs that you're going to want to do before you get started are going to create dust and dirt and crap falling around. And you don't want that falling into your drywall compound, or what I, I call it mud. You don't want it falling into your mud in the wall after you've put it on there, because that just makes a mess. So what you're looking for is you take your four inch knife and you're running around your screws. And as long as it makes that nice scratching sound, you're good. I gotta find one here that's wrong. Oh, there it is. You can hear that? So even though we have a dimpler set on our screw gun, that's gonna happen occasionally. If the screw is going in on an angle, okay? This is probably my son. He always puts the screws in on an angle. Just give a little bit of a tighten up. Make sure you don't have any contact anymore. The other thing you wanna look for is certain areas like I remember when we were screwing this drywall on, the wood backing only comes out to here. And so, you know, this screw is embedded, this screw isn't. But the best way to get a screw out is to get it spinning and then push the screw head to the side so the threads will grab the drywall and it'll, it'll back out a little bit. Then you can just yank it out. Okay. So we take the end of this knife here and we make a dent. Whenever you have an imperfection in a wall, you want to create a dent because a dent can be filled. And here's another one. Here's another one. This is all part of the prep, right? All right. Let's get up here. Now, you want to check your corner. You don't want to be hitting any drywall when you're running down the wall, right? You want that nice and clean because then your metals can stick nice and tight against the wall. If you have bumps and raised sections, it's going to cause an issue. I got some down there. All right. So this is going to be an outside corner. And if you have a little torn paper here on the outside corner, it's not an issue. But if you have torn paper somewhere else, or if your drywall got installed upside down, and I know as homeowners that happens sometimes, you measure and you don't think properly. So you have this huge amount of brown paper face showing, right? You can't apply a drywall compound on that. So we have a trick. Bum, 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 bum. One of my favorite products in the world. Just an oil-based aerosol primer. All right, and what that does is it creates a bit of a moisture lock to protect that brown paper from the compound while it's drying. There we go. Done. Five minutes, that'll be dry. You can put compound over top of that and you're gonna have no problem at all. Worth its weight in gold. 
So once you know that all your screws are sunk properly, your corners are good, your torn paper issues are dealt with, any uh, imperfections are dented and ready to be filled, the only other thing you want to double check is make sure you have enough screws in the drywall sheet. A lot of times when you're putting in drywall, you know, you get moving ahead so fast, you'll miss a screw here or there or a whole row. Make sure it's all done because once you pull out the taping tools, you're not going to have the drill on you anymore and you just don't want to go backwards in time. So make sure you walk through the room, get everything prepped, now it's time to pull out the pail of mud. Let's talk about mud for a second. All right, so Drywall Compound is a, it's an interesting product because there's different companies that manufacture these products in different areas in both countries. Anywhere you go, this is called Machine Mud. Our company is CGC that we have in this area. They make a whole line of sheet rock products. And it doesn't really matter where you live. You're going to have different companies selling the same product, but the important issue here is down here. So to answer all the questions we've been getting, if you have a lightweight, all-purpose, right, ready-mixed compound, that's what you're looking to buy. Doesn't matter what the name is or how they market it and brand it, that's the product. So uh, we have three or four, maybe five different drywall compounds available on the market that are lightweight, ready-mixed. And so it doesn't really matter which one you use. The reality is every single one of them has one thing in common. Even though it says ready-mixed, it's not ready to be applied to the wall. <laughs> You still have to put it in a pail and add a couple cups of water and mix it up. And we're going to get into that process a little bit later to show you about it. But I have just enough mud left over in my pail right now that I can finish taping this. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to show you how to put on your corners. We're going to show you how to mix the special quick drying compound to fill all your corners. Then we're going to show you how to mix your mud and set up another pail of that and do a second coat on the whole room. Stay with us. We've got a lot to cover. And hopefully we'll be able to help teach you something you haven't learned before. Very important when you're working with drywall tools and compound, keep your stuff clean. I mixed this drywall a couple of days ago. And what I do is I take my sponge and I actually wipe the edges and, the, and knock it all down and keep it nice and moist and not crusty because the chunks are what's going to get you on a job like this. Once it starts drying out and getting chunky, it's no longer drywall compound. It's just a mess. You should throw it out. Okay, so we're going to set the tape in the drywall now. There's really only a couple things you need to know. First is you want to apply your mud. Now, wow, we've seen guys showing techniques like throwing all of this mud on the wall like this, right? Holy cow, dude. That's just ridiculous. You're going to spend all day long putting it on and taking it off. Get this garbage out of here. All right. Put your mud on your knife. Hold it sideways. All right. That's how you put drywall mud on the, on the walls, right there. You don't make a mess, it's not going on the floor. There's no more there than what you actually need. Okay, you can go both directions, off the side of the knife. And then you just lightly flatten that out. Just, there we go. So we're just going to set the paper in here. If you want to know where the middle of the joint is, you can go like this. You can feel it, right? Press the middle there. Lightly press it in. Not too hard here. Okay? That's for the homeowners. This is a great little system to help keep you in line because you don't want to end up taping off a line like that. You basically are going to set the tape with the 4-inch knife now by pressing it in. Okay? And you can see here that it's dry. You cover the tape with a little bit of mud and then take it right back off again. All right, that makes it wet and you have to stop. If you keep playing with this, it actually starts to absorb enough moisture, it gets wrinkly and it stretches. It's gonna make a mess on you. Okay, so the secret here is to work quickly. Press the extra mud compound out from underneath. Get it wet. Take the extra off, and the reason you want to have your wet tape wetted on the wall is because wet tape doesn't bubble. If you don't get it wet before or after, it's going to bubble on you. So this is the secret to a nice tape job. Now I know guys that'll wet their tape in a little pail before they put it on the wall. That drives me crazy because then it's already getting wrinkly the whole time you're working with it. I find this is a great way to do it because it goes on dry, you can get it done quickly before it goes wrinkly, and you're not pulling it off the wall and stretching it out and cutting it over and over and over again. 
So my process for taping is to do all of my flats, and that means I've got a factory joint with a factory joint, or small sections like this, right? This is not a factory joint, but I'm going to put an outside corner bead, inside corner. It's going to get covered up so well it's not really an issue, but I want to make sure that it's not going to crack. So we're just going to apply some compound. Always work with your hawk like this. It becomes a drip tray as well. That's something you're never going to have when you're working with that little pan. I hate those things. There's people that talk about the difference between using the pan and using the hawk and what the benefit is one versus the other. And the reality is, hawk holds more mud, helps keep your site clean, and helps keep you clean. I find guys that work with those pans are forever covered in mud and filthy, and job sites have always got drippings everywhere. If you're doing a good job with your taping, you should be able to walk away as clean as you started. So when you're working, keep your tools clean, keep the mud off the edges, always working it back into the middle so that it doesn't start to dry out on you, okay? Now we're taking our paper tape and this stuff comes creased. This has a crease line in it, okay? So it's almost, it's ready to fold. So what I do is I take a quick look at my room and I know every sheet of drywall is four feet. So I go four feet, eight feet, same as the other corner. Whoop. I got a ceiling edge there, ceiling edge there, and there. Ah, that'll probably be enough right there. There we go. Now I've got all my inside corners already folded, ready to roll, sitting on the floor. Okay, and that is going to speed up the process dramatically. Every time you go to do some taping, you've got to stop and do a crease. It will drive you crazy. So the using the drywall knife, you're going to find that the best way to use this knife is off the side. It's applying this way. So you can load it up with mud and slowly force it out. Okay, and by loading it, I mean like, that's it. And you want to just run it out. And it takes a little bit of practice, right? There's a bit of an art form involved with this, but the system is simple enough. And you're going to want to fill the bottom part and then the top part. Sometimes the best way to learn how to do this is just sit and watch this over and over and over again. Now I am not using any pressure here. This is just flattening out the mud, okay? I'm getting any excess out of there. I got too much gap there. I'm gonna fill that up with mud. Now we're ready for tip. Now, this is my technique. Throw a dollop on the wall. It'll hold your tape in place. Because you can set your hawk down and then you're always gonna have your tape available. Okay, now. Because it's pre-folded, we just stick it in the corner, slide it nice and tight, All right? There we go. We can get our hawk because we're gonna wanna have the ability to clean our mess as we go. All right, we're gonna set the tape into the mud with a moderate amount of pressure here, all right? There we go. And the same thing going back the other way. If you do the top going to the left and the bottom going to the right, you'll keep your tape from sliding along the wall. And if you get a ridge like that, just pull it towards you. All right, work it into the corner. Sweet. Remember, in this situation, less is more. If you put too much compound in behind your tape, it takes forever to dry. And then you're gonna add days and days of work. Okay, now I'm just wetting the tape here now, just like we did down on the, on the flat. Putting a little bit on, taking it off. And this is where I cheat. <laughs> I'm actually going to apply a first coat of mud on the ceiling section. Okay, boom. Catch all those drips with your hawk. There we go. Nice and clean. That's going to happen. All right. Now, now I have mud on the ceiling. I want to clean this up. So I'm going to use the knife like this with pressure. Okay. And I'm going to gently come along and just flatten out that lead edge. Same coming back the other way. Okay. So now I have no ridge on the face. 
I'm going to take my knife along here and I'm basically getting rid of all the extra mud that's on the bottom side and on the inside of that corner. Okay, now I'm going to place that in the corner and I'm going to go with gentle pressure just to flatten it out. All right, there we go. And then I'm going to pull back. Always move your tool towards the finish. And then one more good clean. There we go. That's how you set your mud. You've got your tape and you've got your first coat on the ceiling. You have no excess mud on the bottom side of that tape. So tomorrow when it's dry, you can come back and do the bottom and have a nice hard, solid surface to press your knife against. You don't have a ridge over here. There's nothing to scrape, nothing to sand in between coats. That is a perfect application. Here we go. Now, when your corners intersect, it doesn't matter. You still want to put a full complement of mud on the corner off the side of the knife, right over top of the, the flats there from before. Remember, this is a factory edge, so it actually has a dip. So it's nice to fill that before you do your corner. Makes it a little bit straighter. There you go. Just flatten it out. If you see dry sections of the wall where there's no mud, put the compound in there and fill it up. Don't leave it where they have huge gaps. Fill those gaps with the compound, okay? The gaps are really big. You can mix up a little bit of that 45 minute mud and you can fill all your gaps in advance. Uh, we actually did a video on that. I should probably link that in the description below just to help people out in case you need that. Now, here we go. So I'm gonna put this tape up in the corner, but I don't want a rough edge like that. So I'm gonna hold my knife here, all right? Tear that off nice and square. Now it's ready to be embedded up there. There we go. Push it all the way down to the bottom. Hold the knife and just tear off the paper. Now, we're gonna start a couple inches from the top. Pressing that paper in, okay? And then I'm gonna press it up. That'll keep it from sliding down. Okay, and I'm, I'm just putting that little bit of pressure in that corner there. Help set that tape. All right, always wanna finish nice and clean. Now, oh, lean into the wall there. There we go. You can help work the tape into the corner a little bit. It'll help to avoid tears. All right. If there's a wrinkle, just put your knife through like that. If it's if it's bubbling like that, if it's not if it's not sticking down, you can always just come back with your knife. Force a little mud in there. All right, get good contact. Here we go. Okay. Once it's set, get it wet. That actually rhymes. That's a great way to remember it. <laughs> if you know your tape is wet when it hits the wall, it won't bubble. Bubbling tape is the number one problem that you're gonna face in this business because the next day you come back, it's bubbled up, it's hollow, it's in behind there. You have to cut the tape out, you have to reattach it. You lose a whole day of production watching that dry. Just maddening. And that's if you're lucky. Sometimes you won't see the bubble until the second or the third day depending on the lighting in the room. Then you're really in trouble because now you're ready to stand and prime and you got to go back to the beginning on that joint. All right. Sounds like my boy. Now, just like on the ceiling, I'm going to take compound and I'm going to finish one side. I usually do the left side first. It's just a habit. No real reason for it. <laughs> okay. And then I'm going to start here.
And then I'm going to work my way back to the finish. Okay, I'm going to set this in the corner. Create a nice groove, clean out all the excess on the other side, run it back. There we go. No need to sand between coats. Nothing to clean off. Nice and clean. Let's do another one. <laughs> Okay, so this is the area where we had the torn paper. And that's dry now. Beautiful. This is one of those situations where I have a, something that didn't get dented properly there. There's no way you can pull a nice, unless you're filling the hole, right? Beautiful. Just open it up. Put your knife corner right in the middle. Find that edge right there. Here we go. I'm gonna just clean that edge. To have a truly professional drywall job means time and patience when you're setting the tape. This is the point where you make or break your entire job. Too much mud, you've got to be filling it, stretching. Not enough mud, you're gonna have things bubbling. It's a nice combination of filling it and not having too much there and creating nice smooth lines. I only need to put one more coat of mud on this inside corner and it is finished. Money in the bank. All right, now quick recap. We've done our flats, we've done our inside corners and we've filled one side of the inside corners, which is important because there's mud in behind the joint and there's a lot of fill and that usually takes a little extra time to dry. So I would suggest after you're done for the day, put on a fan, but in the meantime, now we've got to take care of our screws. So again, we're going to use that off the side of the knife approach. I'm going to demonstrate this nice and casually here for you. So you're going to keep this down here, pressed against the wall, and you're slowly going to release the mud going up. So you're filling a hole. You're going to push it into the hole this way, and then you're going to hold your knife tight to the wall and pull it down that way. All right, here you go. Push it in. One motion, really. All right, and when you get good at this, you can make really quick work of a room. And then you want to do the bottom as well. Now don't go all the way down to the bottom of the floor because the last row of screws should be where your baseboards are going to go and you don't really need to worry about filling those. I had a rogue screw there, right? Eh? There we are. Okay. Ah. When, now that we've got the screws filled, it's time to put on all of our outside corners, and then we're gonna mix the other 45 minute mud. We'll show you that whole process. We'll fill those corners, and then we'll mix the regular mud and show you how to do that as well. <laughs> and then we're gonna do a top coat on all of those outside corners because it dries so fast. You can get two coats in about an hour. So now that all the joints are taped and the screws are all filled, we're gonna move on to the outside corner. And all you wanna do here is just get a measurement, one side to the other. And this is a measuring technique that I use. I extend the tape and then I run it over to the corner. And it's 74 and an eighth. And that's when I go like this. Because undoubtedly, if you're anything like me, Right about the time that you take a measurement, somebody calls you to ask you a question, the phone will ring, the dog will bark, the bell will ring at the door. Just do this once, write it down, and then if something happens, you still have your measurement later. So I found the best way to measure and cut these is just to run your tape inside the bead, and then bring your snips over to the line, 
bring your snips over the line, give that bead a cut, finish that, hold this so it doesn't bend over on you, and start a little bit below the cut and angle up towards it. Just that couple of degrees makes all the difference in the world. In perfect world, they would send these at 85 degrees instead of 90. I don't know why, but I love to just give them a bit of a squeeze to close them up just a hair so that when I'm putting them, installing them, it helps to establish a little more angle for filling with the mud. I'll show you what I mean. Set it here. Now you see you have, you have room to press it into place. All right, so that helps you to, to establish where you roll it around. This is the most outward point on this surface and on this surface. So if I set it right here, I can put my knife, and you see the shadow in behind it? So the idea here is that you want to have a gap right from the corner to the tip of the knife. And that's something you can fill. Without moving that, check the other side. See if there's a gap there. So you might want to roll it up to create the, see that? Roll it up to create a gap. But now that, find that happy place. Right there in the middle where you can fill both sides to this corner from the wall. That's where you want to nail it in place. Now, a little bit of experience goes a long way here because I can tell where the right spot is just by looking at it. But demonstrating that with a knife gives you an understanding of what you're looking for. You can see that there's two rows of holes here. The one in the middle is actually for the drywall compound to go in and actually bond between the wall and the metal. The other row is where you want to put your nails. We're using the blue ring nail here. It's a very thin flat head. And that is designed so that when you install it, it's not in the way of your knife. So that it is not causing intersection with the taping knife when you're putting your compound on. If you use screws, undoubtedly they're going to be sticking out too far and you're going to go click, click, click when you're filling your mud. You're going to have a problem on your hands. You're going to have to drive the screws too deep. You're going to be bending and twisting the metal, causing all kinds of issues. Learn how to use the hammer and the nails and you're going to be a lot happier with your corners. Pay very close attention when you put your next bead on that you are running that up and you're exactly the same depth, okay? You don't want to be too high or too low. That's a nasty looking corner. Get it right there on the money, okay? And then nail back here so that if you have to make a minor adjustment, you still have a little bit of flexibility before you set the second nail in. That's the only secret of putting in corner beads. Once I get the rest of these up, it's time for us to mix our 45 minute compound do a fill coat, and then it's time for second coat. So now that all of our metals are on, we're gonna do two coats on the metals and our second coat with regular compound on the walls. So here's the secret. We have our sheetrock 45. We, I have warm water in the pail, and this house, we're out in the country, so it's also well water, so it has lots of minerals in it. This stuff is gonna dry super fast, super, super fast. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna mix it. I'm gonna use a four inch knife in my hawk, and I'm gonna apply just a fill coat, just a couple of inches worth of mud. Now, this entire ceiling area here, we're gonna add crown molding from here to here, which is why it's not taped. So I don't need to have a whole lot of mud. Underneath here, um, I don't wanna put too much on here, make a mess near my corner, so I'm gonna use a four inch knife as well. If I use this knife here, I'm just gonna be making a mess of everything, it's too big. But on the outside corner over here, bum bum bum, I'm gonna use this knife to fill a nice six or eight inch kind of wide swath, all right? <laughs> so once I mix this, I've got about 10 or 15 minutes tops. So I'm gonna just run like the wind and try to get all this on. And then we will show you how to do all the second coat on the inside corners and flats. Uh, and then we're gonna come back and put another coat over top of this within the hour. Here we go. All right. Definitely a little bit runny here. Wow. 
So outside corners, generally speaking, we're just filling the gap from here to here. But you see this corner here? These are two different pieces. And that metal edge there, you want to have some tape on there. Because that's the only place in this whole system that's likely to crack. And we use the hawk to hold that still. All right. So, get that tape installed there, press nice and tight. And now we can get some mud on our hawk. And we can just travel that down around the corner. Whoop, it's a little sloppy. <laughs> All right. One of these things about 45 minute mud, when you mix it, you want to mix it a little bit loose. Not too loose that uh, it's raining all over you, but a little loose, especially in the country, especially with warm water. You want it to set up fast, but if you don't mix it a little loose, you won't have enough working time to get advantage of it. Here we go. So it's going to be a little bit sloppy. We're not looking for smooth. All this bubbling is irrelevant because we are just filling the, filling the gaps. We'll put a smooth coat on in a minute as soon as this sets up and hardens. We're just trying to reduce the amount of work as far as days that are involved for filling these gaps by filling it all right now. Okay? We just want to put it on. And because it's loose, pulling up helps. Okay? Clean the edges. So using this knife, you can, you can use it two ways. You can pull it this way, or you can reach down, roll your hand under it a little bit, and pull it up this way. It'll help you so you don't have to bend over quite so far to get near the ground. I don't want to feel like I pulled a little too hard. So it started off as pretty loose stuff five minutes ago. Look at this, because it was warm water. It's like putting Play-Doh on the ceiling now. said, don't worry about the look of this, it's the function that's important. The fact that that is filled up, that's all the, we're worried about, no, we're garbage. Just, just done. So just to recap, because I know when we do these types of videos, people get a little confused. Um, we're using our all-purpose mud for everything, and we use the 45-minute mud as a supplement to help speed our process up. So you can fill all your gaps and cracks, you can use it as the first coat on the corner beads, just to fill the gap. Um, you could even use it to fill your screw holes if you wanted to, and that'll save you a little bit of time with, um, you don't need a third coat on your screw holes if you do it that way. But as a rule, if you're new at this and you're just learning how, mixing everything and doing everything with regular all-purpose compound is a benefit. And here's why you can put your lid on it and you can use it again next day. When you mix your 45, their clock is ticking. It will start off soft like you just saw, and then it'll start to stiffen up, and then wham, it just goes rock hard, and there's no saving that for the next day. So, it, it's very handy to have that in your repertoire and understanding that you have options if you're in a hurry. If you're doing repairs, that's a great thing as well. I'm just in the habit of using it all the time now as part of my process, because it takes a full day to tape most projects and put the paper tape on. And on your second day, you can do your corner beads, do your first coat, mix another pail of regular compound, and then you can do your second coat on everything in the second day. And this is just a little way that I've got designed to get a lot of that mud out without getting filthy. Okay? You can squeeze it out and save every drop if you want. Stuff is uh, almost $20 a bag, which makes that last handful worth about 50 cents. And uh, usually I'm just not in the mood to save 50 cents and get covered in mud, so. <laughs> Here we go. Got a full pail of mud there. This is eight ounces of water. I'm only gonna add about six. When I want my mud ultra smooth for my third coat, I'll go the full eight ounces on a box. But for the second coat, six is plenty. All right, so just squeeze the pail together. Start nice and low. 
It's gonna vibrate a lot. If you bring the blade up too high, you'll get water splashing everywhere. Get that back in your pail of water so that nothing goes hard and crunchy. So here's our mud. It's nice and hard. Uh, 20 minutes ago, I was just finishing the last application on the ceiling where it was like Play-Doh. Now, you can take your knife and just run all these extra ridges off, okay? Create a nice flat surface so we can finish this up. Here we go. Now. This is our all-purpose compound that is designed for different drywall machines, and I love using it all the time. Remember, our goal, because we're adding crown molding, is just to have a perfect three inches here on the bottom. All right. I don't have to go all the way to the top. Just create a nice little finish coat here. Now the best thing about the second coat is again, it doesn't have to be perfect after second coat. All right, you have the luxury of coming back one more time to make things perfect, all right? Ba -da -ba -boom. Now, this is how you can get your corners filled up in one afternoon. We just put these metals on, okay? We mixed up the 45. Warm water, and within just a few minutes, it's rock hard and ready for another coat. Absolutely amazing, right? Now, you'll see my program here. This was the first coat, remember? And the paper I didn't do, but I, I did put a coat on the ceiling. I'm finishing this outside corner. And, I'm doing the bottom side of the inside corner. They don't intersect. It's nice to just have a plan so that you're running against something nice and dry. Now remember the way that we did our corners is we cleaned the edge, we went like this, right? and then we came back and did this the first time. Here's this thing. Now that's rock hard. Now I can actually put my knife up against it and use it as an edge. It makes a perfect corner. A lot of fun here. You can use a lot of mud or a little bit of mud. If you use too much mud, you'll have pitting. If you see that, just run your blade with a little bit of pressure, okay? Flatten all that out. That's what you're looking for. It's better to come back with an extra coat than to try to put too much mud on at one time, all right? That's perfect. <laughs> all right, now, the next time I come in here, I'm not going to use a four inch knife on the ceiling. I'm going to use a five or a six. So it goes from here to here. And I will do one more nice pull. And that'll make this look absolutely perfect. Here you go. You can see the first coat. I did this corner yesterday. This is nice and dry, right? Just double check on your blade around looking for any little bumps that might be left lying around. Go right into the corner and pull your mud away, okay? Now, remember we always want to pull towards the finish mud. It's never gonna be perfect when you do that, but it's so easy to sand. Okay, that's nice. Same for this, the corner bead, right? Use the side of the knife, get it in there. You want this to be a four inch wide blade, Just like your knife is, okay? You're gonna to wanna to take your knife and clean the outside edge. Put it in here. Groove that edge. And then you're gonna come back and then just pull straight down. You'll flatten it into the corner and have a perfect inside 90. All right, at that point, if there's anything left on the outside you wanna fuss around with right ahead. But the important thing is to have a perfect inside corner. That's how that's done. Again, hit all your screw holes. All right, just to make sure every time you pass over a wall, 
you hit the screw holes, it takes three coats of regular mud, or one coat of 45 and one coat of finish. Now, we'll get down off the ladder and we'll show you the rest of the joint. Okay, so we're just going to finish the inside corner here real quick. And you can be even a little bit sloppy here if you want, right? Flatten it out. The important thing is to have more mud than you need, okay? You don't have to be perfect. There we go. Now I just made a huge mess here for you. I'll show you how to fix that. So we're going to come in right in there and groove that out. Okay, so now there's something to fill when I come back with the knife. Pressure, I'll clean the outside. Now I'm just going to run up the middle. You can almost do that blindfold, eh? You will close all the gap up, just hit it a second time. Whoops. There we go. That's about as perfect as you're going to get. Except right there. Okay, now, you'll see that you have your, your paper embedded in the mud. You can see that we had a little bit of a thin finish coat over top of it just to keep it nice and wet. There's absolutely no bubbles. Every time. Never see a bubble on my job site because I always put mud on my tape. Now, again, Get a nice trowel full, okay? It's not going to fall off. Hold it on a, about a 30 angle in both directions. You're snow plowing. You're, you're working against gravity, so you're pushing it up and over at the same time. Okay? Reverse your hand. Now that's lots of mud. There's a lot more than you need, and here's why. You want to take your trowel and put pressure on the bottom, just like we do with a four inch blade. And you want to run that nice and tight. Because what we're trying to do is fill from here to here, where the tapered edge is. Do it on the top as well. You don't want to make the wall any thicker. Now, medium pressure straight across the middle. You're filling the gap. Okay? If you have any lines, just go right out to the corner and flatten them in again. Nice. That's all there is to the second coat. Second coat is actually really quick and simple. If you can do the tape joint on your job, you can do the finish coats. Second and third coat are basically the same. You're basically just filling in all the voids. This wall here is probably going to need one more thin coat. Like I said, we'll add a little bit more water in the mud to loosen it up even thinner so that when we have to sand, there's not much work to it. Uh, just make sure that when you're doing your second coat, you find all your joints, you hit all your screws, all your corners, and any imperfections around your electrical boxes where you cut in, you make sure you repair those while you're at it. Don't get lazy and leave it till later, all right? All right, I'm just going to finish getting this done in a hurry here. Now, we have a new addition to our company. We have a new website now, and I'm going to encourage everybody to pop over there. The link is in the description. What we have there is we've been working feverishly behind the scenes on affiliate links so that you guys can get access to products and tools. And we're starting to work with different companies to get better deals for you. We're really excited about that. All right, so you asked for it, so here it is. This video is all about the tools that I use for getting a professional paint job. And we're not gonna just talk about what the basic setup is. It's all the different details, all the tricks and tips that I've got to give you. And then at the end of the video, I'm also gonna show you how to wash your paint gear. Because if you can wash your brush and get your rollers nice and clean, you can use them over and over and over and over again. And a $7 roller sleeve all of a sudden is a good investment, not just a real big expense. Stay tuned, we're gonna save you a ton of money, and we're also gonna show you the links so you can buy all this stuff and get a good little deal. So my paint gear basically covers a few different areas. It covers preparation, it covers application, it covers cleaning, but it also covers selection. The first thing you need to have if you're going to be painting is options. You need a color deck. So whatever company is selling paint near you that's selling good quality paint, whether it's Dulux, which I love, or Benjamin Moore, or Sherwin-Williams, wherever you can go get professional quality paints at a decent price, go there, set up a cash account, okay? 
and you can get a good deal on your paint. They'll give you 20 or 30% off and they'll give you a fan deck. They'll give you all of their colors. You don't have to stand there in front of that little wall and they have all these little paint chips. They'll give you the whole thing. You can come home. You can check it up against your fabrics and your flooring and everything else. You can take this shopping when you're doing selections, okay? Get a fan deck of the company you're going to deal with where you get your discount and you will save a ton of money. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is preparation. Now, if you're a fan of this channel and you've been watching our videos, you've seen some of my tricks before, but my favorite preparation techniques are all about the Hawk and the 4-inch knife, okay? Now, this 4-inch knife has a cool little feature in it. It has a steel handle on the end, and the purpose of this is so that you can dent the wall to create a void that can be filled with the mud that you're going to mix. Bum, bum, bum. Find a mud with a hardener. This is the company I use, Sheetrock 45. There are other companies making other mixes, 5, 20s, 45s. The, the secret is in the number. That setting number is basically if you add cold water, it takes about 45 minutes for it to set and harden so that you can sand it. Okay? That is a secret to painting in your house because if you use general purpose mud, the dents that you fill are going to shrink when they dry and you'll have to do it a second application. You'll notice and on my table here, there's no such thing as dry decks put it on pink and it dries white, that's a waste of time, okay? This sheet Rock 45 goes on beige and it dries white. It's not a fancy gimmick, it's just a quality product and it does not shrink when it dries. So you can apply that when then by the time you're done patching all your holes in your room, the other, the, you're right back where you started and you can put these tools away and pull out your little sanding sponge, all right? Now there's a lot of different sanding sponges in the world and the point isn't to sell a sponge here but tell you to get one that has this angle here. You want an angled edge. Here's why. When you're sanding your corners, you want to put that angled edge in the corner, all right, and be able to sand like this. Don't put it flat in and go up and down, okay? You'll end up getting a groove here and if it's not angled, you'll get a groove on the other side. Guess what? You're right back to patching again. So get the angled brush and turn it a little bit while you're sanding. And I guarantee you'll never put a groove in your mud. All right? So once you've got it sanded, on all the patches, you're gonna to wanna to sand between coats. So you're gonna to wanna to sand your wall before you prime. If it's new construction, if it's an existing wall, you wanna sand your wall before you change your first coat of paint. What I suggest is the Radius 360. Has these Velcro pads, okay? Now this is 150 grit. Uh, you can also get 220. It's really up to you, but you stick it on and off you go to the races. It works really well with my Sherlock pole. This one's had a lot of miles put on it, but you'll see the quick lock, done, right? And you can sand. This kind of head never rolls over. It won't, like the traditional square ones or rectangle ones, this round one will never roll. You can't. Yeah, you can almost make a turnover if you try really hard. But you can sand blindfolded all day long. It's soft in the corners even, all right? Get yourself one of these. You're going to love me for it. <laughs> now, along with your stick, you're going to get this extension. Now, this is a universal thread. It works for the 360. It also works for paintbrushes. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, when you get your paint, you're going to need to open your can, all right? That's why I suggest everybody should have a five-in-one. This is one of the most versatile tools you'll have in your arsenal, and you can stick it in your back pocket, and you're going to have a screwdriver, you're going to have a scraper, you're going to have the ability to do the denting for your finishing, and you're going to be able to clean the roller with this thing later. I'll show you that. You also use the side here to open your lids, okay? You're going to want to hit north, south, east, and west here. Pop the lid off, you're good to go. This isn't going to cause damage to anything. And you can also use it to hammer it back down. The lid is on securely, your paint won't dry out. Alrighty. If you watch me work, you'll know that generally I pour paint out of the can into a tray. And I use this as my cut-in. But, what if you only bought a little quart and you can't get your brush in the quart? For trim paint, smaller projects, you can get the handy pail. All right. Now this thing here is a plastic with a rubber top and you can get these great little liners. Now watch this. Huh? How awesome is that? There's a magnet built in that grabs the metal on the brush. Your brush doesn't sink too far deep into the paint can. All right. And it won't fall out and make a mess. Now 
This is ergonomic design. You put your hand here, it's nice and easy. You're not holding a wire, you're not gonna get cramps in your hand. If I'm painting all day long with a cut-in brush, like doing a whole house, I use the handy pail because I can work this all day long. It's a lot more convenient than doing this, which is how I hold my can. Right, I got a finger on the wire, I got a finger underneath, I get cramps. After a couple hours of this, you're done. But this is awesome. It'll keep your brush from getting full of paint right up to the metal. So it's a little easier to manage that way. Of course, no matter what you do, you need a knife. All right? This is phenomenal because you can take the blade out like this. You get paint on a window. At a fresh blade, you can actually scrape that off. It's a flexible blade, so you can take off stickers and stuff like that. You can cut back caulking. Always good to have a sharp knife. You might want to have a little bit of tape with you. I'm just saying, I don't use a lot of tape in most of my situations, but every once in a while I'll have a live edge countertop or I'll have something that's really important that I don't want to get any paint on that I don't want to have to scratch off later. So I do cover it in tape, but it's very rare. <laughs> You're going to want to have a mini roller, all right? A little four or six incher. I like the long handle because if I'm using a mini roller in a lot of cases, uh, I'll be using it up against the corner of a high visibility area so I can texture my brush line, right? I don't want to use the big roller and get right in there. These little mini fillers here, if you roll them right up into the corner, they're not going to scratch up the wall where the traditional larger rollers will. So this is really handy if you are worried about the details, making sure you don't have any brush lines. You can also use this in conjunction with the sleeve to do all of your patching and priming on the walls. It's a lot faster than a brush and it makes sure you don't put too much paint on the wall. All right, now, before we show you the workhorse, my rig for my tray, let me get this out of here. I'm going to show you a paintbrush option. This is a paintbrush option. It's called the Gooseneck, okay? And I've got my attachment threaded in there that I showed you earlier. And this can go on my paint stick. And my paint stick comes two to four foot. I've also got a four to eight, and I got an eight to 16. This gives me the ability to go like this. I can load it up, paint in my brush, in my handy pail or my can. I can take it out, I can snap it on, and I can paint really, really far away. Okay? I can paint like this. So when I'm standing at the top of the stairs and I've got my railing and I'm looking over the stairwell, I can take one of my poles, load up my paintbrush, and I can stick it 10, 12, 14 feet away, and I can paint these lines from inside the brush perfectly up against the ceiling like that. That is worth the money. Now here's the other feature. If you're in an awkward place, you've got a banister. This is why it's called the gooseneck, okay? Huh? Now I can be standing here and I can reach over top of something and I can set my brush into that line and I can cut an edge. That flexibility, you'll never know when you're gonna need it, but when you need it, I'm telling you, it's worth the investment. Have that in your arsenal. All right, the gooseneck brush. <laughs> okay, then we also have this lovely gizmo. Now, there are situations like up against a trim. If you're painting a room and the trim is good and you're not going to paint the trim, what you can do is you can use this. This is just a straight line. It's a guide. And you can stick that up against the, the door trim or window trim, and then you can paint your wall right up against it. Let's see how it did. Not bad. Nice clean line. It's a lot faster than taping, okay? So just having one of these. These are also really good for painting trim up against the carpets. Okay? You stick that down there onto the floor and then you roll it forward to protect all the carpet. Then you can paint your trim nice and low. All right? And then you just pull it out. Have a sponge and a pail handy. Keep it clean as you go. All right? This is not something you want to have caked down with paint or it stops working. Speaking of sponges. This is a special sponge made for wet sanding. Now in some situations when you're working as a painter, you're going to be in someone's finished home, you're doing a touch-up, a callback, or you're working in your own home and let's say you're in a beautiful open concept house and you're just changing the paint on your handrail and you made a mistake, you dinged a wall, you had to do a touch-up, but you don't want to be sanding drywall dust in a finished space with all your china out and everything else. Here's the secret. You do your mud, get your patching done. When you're done, you put this in the pail, you wring it out, and you take the rough side on the wall and you can sand and then at the end you just do one pass with this side to clean all the dirt and crap off the wall and it leaves it perfectly smooth. 
give it about 20 minutes to dry again, and then you can go back and do a primer, a little roller, and then boom, you're done. This is worth money in the bank. We got everything done here. We're going to talk about cleaning in just a second, but let's talk about the paint rig that I like to work with. Okay. I'll bring this right up here. This is a Sims tray. It's a really rigid jumbo tray. I can put three quarters to about 80% of a gallon of paint in this tray, and that leaves me about an inch and a half or so in the can. And for me, that's a perfect blend of cutting and rolling. Now, I use the Sherlock stick and the Wooster handle because they are designed to work together. And then I use a microfiber sleeve. Now I like a 15 mil. This is 3 8 or half inch nap down in the United States. It's really good. It holds a lot of paint and I can do two or three rollers wide on the second coat. And it's just really super speedy. Now they make them bigger. They make them double wide. Yeah, and I've got all these guys commenting, oh, we like to put our paint in a pail with a grid. But here's the problem. Every time you pour paint, you're wasting it. If you pour it into a pail, right, and you put in your, your screen, every time you're working with that, you're mixing air, and you have to dunk your roller into the pail and then clean it off. This is so much more efficient, okay? That screen may be quick and easy for you guys, but I'm telling you, if you had this, you would switch because this handle here sits on the tray and this part here just locks in over top of all of that. All right. And now I got all the weight right here of a full gallon of paint and I can walk around all over my job site with no spills, no mess, no fuss. Bam. This little handle also rests my cage. It's brilliant. All right. So if you want to work with no fatigue, you don't want to be bending down and picking up and carrying that trail over all precariously, holding your handle at the same time. This is a solution. It's just a few bucks. It's a piece of plastic, but it works. This is what I like to use. I also like to use tray liners. Okay, they come the same size as the jumbo tray. Use the liner. When you're done, you throw it in the garbage. You don't have to worry about constantly cleaning your tray. I think I've covered all the information I need to cover about the tools that I use. Now we're going to show you how to clean your rig. Because at the end of the day, if you can't clean your gear, you're going to be buying new brushes all the time. Now this brush here, man, I'm telling you, I've had this for almost a year. I use it almost every day. It's amazing. Clean it right, it'll last your lifetime. This cage here, I've been using this one for about two or three years, I think. The sleeve, this is the seventh time I've painted a wall with this one sleeve. They last a long time. That means it's cost me one dollar to paint a room. Hmm? Seven dollar sleeve costs a dollar to paint the room. It's not even close to being done. I'll use it until it starts leaving lint on the wall, but this thing here just keeps on going and going and going. So, yeah, if you know what's going on with my channel, you know I'm in the middle of a huge kitchen renovation. I set up a temporary kitchen and I always do that with a laundry sink. And that's because it gives me a great place to clean my gear inside. <laughs> so let's go take care of this. We'll show you all of my tools for doing that. One more thing, before we go and wash our gear, I'm going to show you a secret. Because this is really, really valuable in a lot of situations. I know a lot of people, when they're done with their paint here, they just wash it. But you really got to be careful that you keep the can around with a little extra paint in it. So if you set your, set your cage on your paint can like this, and you take your 5-in-1, it is exactly perfect radius for just a little bit wider than the roll, okay? And you can scrape all of that paint off. Take three passes and be done with it. Okay, what you're gonna find is there's about a quarter, a quarter of a quart. <laughs> it's enough paint to do all the touch-ups that you're ever gonna need right there. Of course, if you have more left over in your tray, we're going to just do like this, like this. You can release that. Now, watch this technique because when you're using liners, the whole thing can fall out and make a heck of a mess. Hold it together like this with your finger on the liner. Okay, so con contact and contact and do a quick pour right back in the can. All right. 
Stop the dripping. Now we're ready to wash up. All right, so welcome to my temporary kitchen. <laughs> while we're renovating our kitchen. Now, if you haven't seen the video on this subject yet, we're gonna put the link up here, a little card. Feel free to click and watch that because if you're doing a major renovation in your home and you wanna have a temporary kitchen, this is perfect. And the reason for it is the laundry sink. This doubles as a workstation as well as a food prep area. So, I highly recommend it. This is years of experience culminated in six linear feet of pure wonder. Now we are gonna go talk about washing the gear. We got rollers and we got brushes and we got trays. Now, here's the best part about this, okay? I have a tray liner. Oh, tray's washed. <laughs> if you don't use the tray liner, here's the secret. Throw this in the bottom of the sink, all right? Turn on the hot water and let it run for about five minutes. And the paint that's stuck and dried onto the bottom of that tray will peel right off like a, like a saran wrap sheet, okay? The trays are made out of oil-based products and the paints are latex. So they don't actually bond, it just dries in place. So if you add hot water to it, the water will actually get underneath it and lift it right off. And then piece of cake. After a few minutes, you just empty the water and you can grab a corner and peel it out like a sheet. You'll love it. Now for us, We've got two roller sleeves here. I'm going to show you two different options, okay? So one of the reasons this stick looks all beat up the garbage is because I do this when I want to get the sleeve off. All right, that is an effective technique to remove a sleeve from a Wooster tray. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to wash our roller cage because we don't want mountains of paint building up on these, okay? Because then it gets really difficult to get the sleeves on and off. Very important that you get these two ends incredibly clean all right now I don't care if a little paint dries up inside the cage but just make sure that the edges are all cleaned up there we go the outside here as well because this isn't this is a spot where paint builds up it'll break off when you're loading your tray and then you'll have a chunk in your paint and your goal as long as this spins freely you're good to go. If it doesn't, you might need to take your 5-in-1 and get right in this little groove in here and clean dried paint out, okay? Make sure that this spins freely. Hang it off the side of your, your sink here. Okay, now, this roller, we actually scraped clean just to get the extra paint out. What we're gonna do this time, is we're gonna take the same tool so I've got my roller sleeve set up here, and it's standing on end, and I've got a, a fountain basically happening. Now, if I was to leave this running long enough, maybe 20, 30 minutes from now, it would actually be all clean. But to help speed the process up, we're gonna take this, I'm gonna use a lot of force this time, and really scrape it. All right, so we're gonna help speed this process up. We're gonna just get all that extra paint out. All right, you're gonna wanna do that a few times. Now, I also want to clean out inside. Just use your finger. Sometimes a little bit of paint bundles up in there. Now, we're gonna just pull through my fingers and clean as I roll. Now, at this point, I'm gonna say that it's probably 80% clean already. Now, if I set it up and I turn on the water, It'll cascade over and it'll just slowly wash all of that paint. Gravity is your friend here. And if we gave that five or six minutes, you can see all the paint at the bottom escaping. It's just being pushed out, right? So that's one technique. And if you've got time and you're not concerned about wasting water, that works great. If you are concerned about wasting water, then you can work this with your 5-1 the whole time you're doing this. Okay. There you go. Now I'm just going to load this up with water here real quick. Kind of like eating corn on the cob, right? Okay, so that's done.
Now you put it back on your cage. Go find yourself a 2x4, go outside, lay it on the ground, put your paint stick back on, and roll this down the 2x4. <sighs> and you'll end up getting rid of all the water, and you're actually ready to paint right away. Or, you can go out and pick up one of these. So this is a paint spinner, and the, basically the idea is to stick your roller on there. Okay, release the lock mechanism. Right, this is kind of like an old-fashioned drill, actually. Brand new. The other option you have, of course, when you're dealing with this mess, same thing. Oh. Scrape the paint out, put it on the spinner, and soak it down like a corn on the cob. All right. Now leave it in the bottom. And just do this probably two or three times. There we go. That's looking really good. There we go. Brand new. The spinner also is an attachment. You can put your paint brushes in it, okay? And it does exactly the same thing with a paintbrush, but it's not really necessary. For washing a paintbrush, let's just talk about this for a second. Washing a paintbrush, it's actually an art because when you're working, you're trying not to let paint get all the way up to the top, okay? Which is why it's nice to have a pail with a magnet on it that holds the paintbrush this direction, or you leave it in your paint can sitting straight up. Try to avoid leaving it across the top because then paint will end up running inside the brush. When you're washing, you don't want to wash it upside down. You want to wash it in the same direction you're carrying it. So, now we have a different tool. This tool here has got a bit of a comb on it, and you can work that into the bristles. And this is really nice if you've been using it for a while, and you want to get some of that gooped up acrylic out of the inside. Maybe just hardened up a little bit, okay? So this tool is really effective. It also has that 5-in-1 circle on it, but it's not as strong as the 5-in-1, the steel. So I recommend using the 5-in-1. So what we're going to do now is we're going to hold the brush down, and I'm going to work the bristles with my thumb on a bit of an angle just to work any of the dried up paint off the edge. Okay? Just a little bit of contact, a little bit of contrast goes a long way here. Because when we're dealing with the latex paints, we're dealing with the acrylic buildup. That's the really big issue here. The paint itself comes out, but the acrylic is what the problem is. Now, that may look clean, okay? But here's what we do. We actually massage it this way now, forcing that paint out. And then as long as there is paint coming out in that water, you want to keep going at it. So if you have a lot of paint inside, you're best to do this. This forces the water up to mix with the paint, and then you can flatten it out like this and rinse it all off the bristles as it, as it comes up to the surface. I loaded up my brush again so you can see. Just dabbing it in the bottom. Okay. We'll take all that extra paint out. I'm just massaging it. Okay. The truth is, the last time I was doing that, I just didn't have a lot of paint in that yet. That, sim that simulates more what it's like when you've been painting for an hour. Okay. Now, it looks pretty clean, right? And here's how you can check. You go like this. Oh, see all that paint coming out? It's not done yet. Okay, so we're going to keep on doing this for a little bit. Working, massaging, massaging, getting some water down there. All right, we want to get all that paint out. All right, go like this. No paint's coming out. So now we know we got the acrylic gone, the paint's out. There's one step left, and that is this. Take your dish soap and pour a bead right down the middle of that. Okay? Now we're just going to work the bristles into your palm. This is going to fill that brush full of soap. And so now we're going to wash it one more time, but this time we're going to wash the soap out. 
just to guarantee that all that acrylic is gone. This brush will work like it's brand new for years and years and years if you keep it nice and clean. And that means you got to get rid of the acrylic. If you let the acrylic build up inside the base, right now all these bristles are bound right here. But if you let the acrylic build up, it goes like this and this and this and this, and then you lose flexibility. You can't paint with two inches of brush. Okay. Let's see if there's any soap left in here. Looks good. Now, and now we're going to dry it. Okay. Put your hands together and just spin. Form your bristles. And then you can let that dry and it's brand new again. Loving it. Now, one more thing I'm going to mention. If you were working, I try to wash your brush every hour. Okay? If you don't, you're going to get this build up of gunk of acrylic on the edge. You can get a wire brush and you can actually wire brush the acrylic out of your brush. Okay? This will not hurt your brush to use a wire brush on it. And that'll clean all the acrylic off and leave it looking brand new again. Now, if you take those steps, you're going to have tools and equipment that actually get better for you in time than they are right out of the box. Welcome back to my kitchen renovation. We've got a beautiful sunny morning here, so don't mind me. I'm just trying to get my quick set mud ready to go here. When I have this much sunshine beaming through a window, I take advantage of it for my prime check. Like, I was running around with this thing last night, you know, before I did my first coat of paint. And I came down here this morning, and lo and behold, the sunshine has revealed all kinds of sins on my wall. <laughs> that sounds almost poetic, doesn't it? Here we go. So this is just 45 minute compound. I'm just using cold water, so I have a few minutes to actually work with it. But what we're gonna to talk to about today is when you're finishing your drywall and going into paint, the different steps of construction so that you can get a flawless finish. Okay, here we go. Wow, that is just amazing. What you can see, and this is what drives you crazy, because at some point, down the road after you're all finished paint. You're going to be sitting here and the light is going to be just, you know, February when the sun is low in the sky. That's when you're going to see all these little minor scratches and imperfections. Doesn't look like much. But there's nothing like sitting on a couch watching TV and going, oh my lord, look how horrible that drywall work is, right? So I am just taking advantage of this light. Okay. Give me two seconds and I'm going to walk you through the whole process. All right, so traditional building process when you're working with your drywall is pretty much you do your three coats of mud, you sand the room, you prime the room, you do a prime check, and that's the process traditionally of taking a light like this and walking around, checking your inside outside corners, um, looking to see if all your narrow holes were filled properly or if you have divots. I had a few divots in the other ceiling. Not a big surprise. Like when you're doing your drywall work, you're going to run into situations where Different aspects of the work only got two coats instead of three, or the screws were put in just a little deeper than usual. This is why we do a prime check, just to help take care of all those little imperfections. And it's a lot easier after you've sanded the ridges off to go back and fill the divots and the scratches than to try to sand everything perfect the first time. Now, what I like to do, the secret to why, how I get such a great finish when I'm done, is I'll actually sand it and I'll prime it, do a prime check, but I use a 45 minute compound here when I do my prime check because after that compound is on, all of my ceilings are going to get two coats of paint. All of my walls are going to get two coats of paint. And this compound here does not flash through the paint after it gets two more coats. So I'm really confident with that situation. I'll come by and I'll do one coat of paint on all the ceilings and walls. I'm not going to use the brush and cut in as you can see, but this allows me to have the colors in the room, right? that are going to be here long term so I can experience the daylight shining into the room bouncing off these colors because the ceiling with that daylight coming across the horizon exposed a lot of things that I never saw. This colored paint once I put the, the, the light on it showed a lot of things I didn't see with my trouble light. So it's just nice to do one coat. It also lets me have a look because it takes what 20 minutes to roll all the walls. It allows me to have a look at the color in the finished space and confirm whether or not we like what we see. <laughs> so now that the prime check is all done, 
we're gonna have my wife come down, we're gonna pull out some tile, we're gonna talk about plans for the future on the back wall, but we get to experience the color in our kitchen, and decide if we wanna go darker or lighter or something different altogether. But this is a great time. It only takes half an hour and half a gallon of paint, so you can invest that. Now, you've all seen the TV shows where they put like five or six colors on the wall and so these little squares. I don't know for how for the life of me anybody can decide that that paint color works by a little square. Most people don't have that kind of vision. So my wife is a visual inspector. She doesn't see things in her head before it's finished like I do. So I take everything one step at a time, show her a completed space, get approval, and then move forward. It works, but that's how most people work, right? So if you're like most people, you're gonna to wanna to get one coat on your walls, double check the space before you get too committed to doing all the tedious brushwork and the details. Huh. And once you're happy and you're ready to move forward, then it's simple. Now I'm gonna get rid of this, and we'll talk about the rest of the stages so you can finish off your room. All right, so now that our patches are all dried up, we're gonna come back with a sanding block. This is a medium to fine grit, right? And you can, just give it a nice little scuff, okay? That'll work great. Your other option, because when we do this, we're also gonna be sanding the rest of the wall. It needs to be sanded. We can take our sanding pad here. Now, this is my Radius 360, okay? I put it on my painter stick, because it has this little adapter. And we are gonna call this first coat. So we're gonna also need to sand in between coats. So we wanna go completely up and down here. Sand the whole surface, including your patches, okay? That's the other option. Now you can see it was brand new clean. All these spots here are little chunks of dirt and issues that were on the wall. And now is sanded smooth and it collects it right here. I got this question a lot actually dealing with sanding walls, do you have to clean all the dust off? And the answer is no. When you sand your drywall the first time, you're going to have a bunch of dust left on the wall. When you're adding your primer, that dust gets mixed in with the paint and it becomes part of the solids content of the paint. Now that's a fancy word for high quality primer has a lot of solid content. Okay, so having dust on the wall just means you're going to make your paint even better. It's going to make it much more solid white and less transparent. And that allows you to see all the imperfections. It'll also fill in a lot of hairline scratches left over from sanding. So leave the dust on there, get your first coat, patch it, check it in the sunlight, repair it with your 45, sand it again, sand your whole wall, right? Then it's time to prime. Now, I've done this in other videos and I've talked about my Sheetrock 45 material and how I'm confident that I can just go ahead and put two coats of paint on that and I'm good to go. But if you don't have that available in your area, then you follow this procedure. Just take a bit of primer and brush it on. Okay, done. Now we only have to wait about five or six minutes and a light dusting like that is going to be perfect. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead, sand the rest of this wall, patch the rest of these spots up and then we're gonna go from there. This is the whole process for sanding between coats. There we go, that's done. Now the most amazing thing about that is it makes the wall incredibly smooth, all right? Now we'll hit the rest of these patches. Just a light dusting, right? You're not looking to put a lot of paint on the wall here. There we go. And the purpose of this is just to make sure that all these little spots, if you're using regular compound, they don't end up showing through in the sunlight. This is what happens. It's called flashing. Flashing is the painter's enemy because whenever you have flashing after two coats of finished paint, you can't just go along with the brush after and touch it up because that'll show too, because you're leaving brush mark instead of roller mark. You can't just go by with a little mini roller because acrylic paint, after it's been sitting for a little bit, the levels of acrylic are different from the beginning to the end. So the only way to make a nice wall when you're painting 
is to paint the whole wall, top to bottom, the whole section. So you can't do touch-ups on flashes. So better safe than sorry. Hit it with your primer. Oh, there we go. And you can avoid that cost and mistake because flashing in your paint is going to leave you really disappointed. Also means you got to go back out and buy another gallon of paint in order to fix that wall. Because most rooms, one gallon of paint will do jump fine. But if you get flashing, you don't have enough paint left over to do the whole wall again. And that is how you avoid it, right there. Now, we're going to give this about 10 minutes. I'm going to come back with the brush, do the same thing, and we'll show you there. Okay, so while you're waiting for your primer spots to dry, you can go ahead and grab your paint because we still have to do our cut line. Now, if you want to learn my process for painting walls, we'll put a link in the video. You can click the card right here. But what I'm going to do is I basically have five or 10 minutes waiting for this to dry up. So until that's done, I might as well do my first cut in. And having that finished is just good use of time, right? You know that old expression, nobody wants to sit around watching paint dry. Well, the truth is, if you have the right order of doing things, your paint's always drying while you're working, you're never wasting your time. Ooh, gotta be a little careful here, my bench is wobbly. Yeah, that's right, you're watching this correctly. There's no tape needed for my process. In the other video I'll show you, I can actually paint this wall faster than you can put the tape on it. I'm talking about in the time it takes for most people to put the tape around their ceiling, I can cut and roll and do all my patching. Uh, so you should learn how to paint like this. Boom. So I just finished doing all the cut line. Now my primer is dry. Now we're going to come by. We're going to call this the first coat of color on the wall. All right. And we're just going to brush over the primer. Same thing. Nice and light. We're not doing anything here as far as adding too much texture. Don't want to have too much in the way of brush lines. Really feather that out. Just want to add the color. All right. And what we're doing here is we're just prepping for the second coat. So we can just get this on. Now, this color that I'm using actually covers incredibly well. So I don't have to be that careful. Depending on your paint, be careful. You might want to put a nice little mini roller involved in this program just to get good coverage. Because the brush, you can see it leaves these little white streaks. Okay, so depending on the paint you're using, if you use the lighter touch, you'll get much better coverage. So that's just a tip right there for you. There we go. Good coverage. Feather the edges. And the reason I'm using the brush over and over and over again, because it's a really good fail-safe technique. If you have uh, blues and reds and that sort of thing, you might find it even necessary to do a brush coat like this and then come back with a mini roller and then an extra coat on your patch just to get the right kind of depth of color in it. There's a lot of real popular colors out there that are somewhat translucent nowadays. They're a real pain in the butt to do repair work on. Uh -huh. Now you'll see the time that it takes you to run around your room and hit all your patches, this paint will dry because we're putting it on real thin. Okay, this whole application only needs about five or ten minutes. And by the time you're done prepping your patches, you can just come right back with the brush and the roller and do the wall all over again and put the final coat on. Now I wanted to mention really quickly, um, because I don't have any trims done yet, some of you are going to notice, hey, what's going on with the ceiling up here? It's pretty nasty and where's the baseboard? Here's the thing. When you're doing a project of this scale, a couple of rooms, all the drywall work, the ceiling paint, the wall paint, all the touch-ups, you've got a lot of time. It's in your favor here. You can put in the carpentry at any point before you roll your second coat, okay? So what we're going to do is just show you, here's my baseboard, right? Now, what I'm going to do today is actually set up some sawhorses in this room. I'm going to paint all my baseboard trims out. I'm going to paint all my crown out. And then I'm going to cut and install it so that I only have a quick little few nail holes and some caulking to do. Then I can do my entire second coat. And we're going to be able to show you that process at the end of this video, but I just give you an idea. All that's left for finishing this room, my process is to install this baseboard about a quarter to half inch off the ground. And I'll just nail it in like that. And then when I come do my flooring, my flooring will slide up and underneath, okay? And you'll see that there'll be a gap. 
Old homes especially, is really necessary to do it this way. And then you come back with a small detail trim like a door stop or a shoe mold, and you close that gap after the fact. There's no way you're gonna get a piece this thick of wood to follow the contour and close all those gaps up. A short piece might look really pretty. And you might wanna say there's an argument for putting the flooring in first. Now in new homes, you could put the flooring in first and then put all your trims on and avoid that detail element. But in older homes like this, the, the walls have got too much of a curve. And even though we're using some floor leveler in places, it's really difficult to guarantee that you can manipulate this board. So what I like to do is put all my baseboards on first. I have them painted. I use the adhesive on the back. I stick that on the wall, throw the odd brad nail in, in part of the detail so that I can just put some of that 45 compound in there. But like I said, we'll get all that detail in a minute. But this is why I'm installing with a gap. And then I've got probably two days of touch-ups and waiting for the good sunlight and all that sort of thing. I'm not in a hurry to finish the paint. So while I'm working on the paint, I can also do all the trim. Here we go. Ah. And of course, if you install your drywall with a gap under the floor, you have lots of room for expansion and contraction with any kind of flooring that you install. So once everything is all done, we're gonna take in our second cut. Now listen, important to know that when you're painting your walls, on the first coat, you can do the cut after the roll. There's no rule about that. But on the second coat, you really wanna do all the cutting in details on each individual section of wall and then roll it right away while it's wet. Remember the technology in paint nowadays has it so that this coat of paint can actually dry in about 20 minutes. And you really wanna go wet edge on wet edge. So having a good technique here to finish quickly is important. All right, well, I hope you really enjoyed that video. And listen, if you're watching how to do drywall because you're in the middle of a major project, then we might I consider you watch one of these two videos. We got a A to Z project, how to do your whole basement from scratch. And we also have a great modern bathroom right from the very beginning, right to the last finishing touches. Click one of those. You can join us for the ride and fill yourself with lots of information to help you out in your next project. We will see you soon.